uh, machine learning for molecules. Uh, and in particular, we're going to focus a bit on graph neural networks. And later, I will tell you about uh, deep generative models for molecules as well. And if we have some time, uh, we'll talk about meta learning, but we'll see how things go. <laughs> uh, great. So uh, this area of machine learning for molecules is actually uh, in explosion at this moment. There is a lot of interest in applying machine learning in this domain. Uh, machine learning has been extremely successful in other settings like computer vision, speech recognition, uh, natural language processing. Um, and the next domain where people believe that machine learning can have a, a major impact is uh, uh, chemistry and uh, uh, molecules. So let's just start with some motivation for, um, for this area. Uh, it turns out that everything around us is made of molecules. Uh, most most of, of, of the things around, that, around us is made of molecules. And uh, they have an important impact in our lives. Uh, we can uh, have molecules that can be uh, used as uh, drugs to treat uh, diseases. Uh, we can use uh, a specific uh, new molecules to build more efficient solar panels or uh, to uh, remove uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Uh, this is great. New molecules have a lot of uh, useful functions. But uh, finding new molecules with uh, useful properties is actually quite uh, slow. And the reason for this is that whenever you have a particular molecule, seeing how good it is for a particular task is quite expensive. You may have to synthesize the molecule, uh, build maybe some device that is uh, uh, based on the molecule, and uh, collect some data doing some real world experiments. This is very time consuming. And then humans have to look at maybe the data that you collected and then make some decisions based on some data. And uh, that also slows down uh, the, the progress. There is also a useful thing, another useful application, which is uh, batteries. Uh, you can try to, to find uh, new materials for building uh, more efficient batteries as well. So all this is uh, slow. And uh, it turns out that you can use machine learning uh, methods to try to speed up this process. So things are changing, and now you can try to introduce more automation in this process. Uh, and uh, some of the things is that now there are more and more molecular data sets. Um, and like in other areas, like in computer vision, speech, or natural language, uh, typically you don't have that much data in the area of molecules. But now more and more data is becoming available. In particular, uh, there are numerical methods called density functional theory-based techniques that allow you to obtain estimates of the properties of molecules without having to do experiments. Uh, you just use the theory of quantum mechanics, and that's going to tell you all you need about the, the properties of the molecules. In practice, you need to do approximations, and that's what the density functional theory uh, gives you. Uh, so just based on compute, uh, you can collect data about properties of molecules. And an example is. Uh, a data set, uh, this is a bit old, this data set. Now you have more modern data sets. But this is data from the Harvard Clean Energy Project, where they uh, evaluated the properties of molecules to be uh, useful for building solar panels. And you have an example here. This is a computer cluster where you have um, a lot of computers here, and each one has a molecule, and it's running simulations trying to estimate the property of this molecule. These take about a, a few hours to run these simulations. And uh, if you have millions of molecules, you can use a huge uh, uh, supercomputer to, to collect data for all those molecules. This is also expensive to collect all this data by running simulations. Uh, so we are going to see later how to do machine learning to, to speed up this. There is another very well-known uh, data set, which is QM9. QM9 is <laughs> A data set that contains all the molecules, all the, all the possible molecules with nine uh, uh, heavy atoms. And uh, they have uh, obtained estimates of the properties of these molecules running these simulations. And there is plenty of data. And like this, there are many other data sets now available in this area. Good. So now we have data, and we can actually do things with those data, uh, data points. And uh, what you can do is actually uh, feed machine learning predictors to this data. You may have data about the properties of many molecules. You may have a new molecule, and you don't know the properties of that new molecule. What you can do is to train a machine learning method on your 
data that was expensive to collect by running simulations or doing real world experiments, and then you can make predictions with machine learning very fast on new molecules. And that can actually uh, help when you have to make decisions. Uh, should you run an expensive simulation for this molecule? Maybe if your machine learning method is saying this uh, probability that it has a good property, this molecule is very low, then why would you waste compute running simulations for that molecule? So this is illustrated in this, in this plot. Um, so you may have this uh, molecule here, and you can run a simulation that is going to take on the order of some hours, um, and you will obtain uh, some property for, for the molecule. Uh, but that's uh, slow, uh, in, and instead, what you can do is maybe you already have data for many other molecules uh, like this. You may train a machine learning method. This could be an neural network based method. And then now you can make predictions on your candidate molecule very fast. Training the machine learning method is uh, slow, it takes uh, several hours, but you do it only once. And whenever you have a candidate molecule, you can make predictions very, very fast. And you can decide if you should uh, collect data for those new molecules or not. Um, you can also uh, use machine learning to close the loop. Like, based on these predictions of the machine learning methods, then you decide what data you are going to collect next. Um, and then uh, you can uh, speed up the whole process for finding new molecules with uh, useful properties. You collect some data. Maybe initially you choose uh, randomly what molecules to try, or maybe based on some expert intuition. Um, then you fit some predictive model to that data. And then based on the predictions of that model, you decide what data points to collect next, what molecules you should uh, uh, collect data for next, so that you find fast uh, new molecules with useful properties. By the way, if any has any anyone has any questions at any point, feel free to interrupt. I will be happy to, to address any questions. Good, so that's great. Then you need to apply Sorry, machine learning uh, now to molecules. Could yes. You, could you please elaborate a little bit more on this DFT method? I mean, yeah. In very general, how how does it apply to molecule? I yeah. So <laughs> this is more for experts in chemistry, and uh, I would I would say uh, most people doing machine learning they don't really understand density functional theory. I myself I know that I have a high level understanding of of what it is, but I don't really understand the details of this. This is based on quantum mechanics. Uh, quantum mechanics, the theory, tells you everything about a molecule. The problem is that the calculations that you need to do to obtain the exact properties of the molecules are intractable. Uh, they are intractable for, uh, unless the molecule is trivial. I think it's just for the hydrogen atom or, or very small molecules you would be able to find uh, these properties. Uh, exactly. So you have to do approximations, and uh, density functional theory is a way to do these approximations. You could understand it as a numerical method that generates uh, an approximation for the properties of the molecule. And there are tons of varieties of DFT methods, and you have also many different levels of approximations from very accurate ones that are more expensive to cheaper ones that are uh, less accurate. I hope that helps. Uh, good. Yes. And also, can you give a couple of examples of the properties that you are talking about? Yeah, the properties, uh, for example, could be the energy level of the uh, electronic orbitals in the molecule. Uh, and this could be related to, in the case of organic photovoltaics, uh, you could obtain a, an estimate of the power conversion efficiency, for example, like if uh, how how useful this molecule would be for trans transforming light into electricity, you will get like some estimates, and uh, that could be a, an example. Um, another one could be you may have a target protein and you want to find a drug-like molecule that binds to the target protein, and then you will have some property that is uh, related to the binding affinity. You will obtain estimates of that property in different ways. Uh, one common one is uh, based on docking. There are docking uh, simulations that will give you estimates of, this, of these properties. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask if the ML model is predicting properties based on like existing molecule property pairs, or if it's trying to replicate the like approximations of the DLT. Uh, very good question. Uh, you could actually 
you could actually do the same thing. Um, so typically, you will have data based on this on these properties, um, and yeah, you will have like pairs of uh, this is the molecule, this is the property, and the machine learning method is just going to learn the association. Uh, you could actually uh, use uh, machine learning to improve these DFT calculations. And you could try to look at the errors that the DFT calculations have in practice, and then you could uh, learn a machine learning method that predicts these, these errors. So you have like now numerical methods that are using machine learning to be more accurate. So I mean, you could use it in, in different ways. Good. Any other questions? Good. Uh, so um, we are going to apply now machine learning uh, methods to molecules. And uh, the first thing that you need to do is to organize your data. And you will need to work with molecules. And there, is a, there are several libraries that are quite useful for this. RDKit is a Python library that is probably the most widely used for this. You can uh, load molecular data. You can visualize it in, in terms of molecular graphs like this. Um, you have a lot of functionalities there. You could generate some simple, you can already do some simple machine learning based on this. Um, but this is mainly used to, to load your data and pre-process it and visualize it. But if you want to run machine learning on molecules, you start to run into some challenges because of the properties of this data. This data is slightly different from the traditional data that you use in machine learning. In machine learning, typically, you have data represented as a vector. And then you feed that into your machine learning method, and you get a prediction. And that's quite straightforward. But with molecules, the data is not really represented as a vector. The data could be the inputs could be um, a molecular graph. And then machine learning methods, they don't uh, accept, by default, molecular graphs. So you will have to do something special with this data to be able to run machine learning methods. Um, uh, and that's what we are going to see in this in this uh, tutorial. I'm going to tell you about different ways in which you can uh, encode molecules uh, or, or run machine learning methods on molecules. Um, so let's see how you can do that. We are going to see a few different ways in which you can encode the molecules um, to, uh, to run machine learning methods on them. Uh, the first one is called uh, molecular fingerprints. It's very similar to a graph kernel. Maybe some people are familiar with kernel methods here, graph kernels. Uh, <laughs> OK, uh, we are going to see a brief overview of these molecular fingerprints. They were proposed within the chemistry literature, uh, but they are very similar to existing graph kernel uh, methods used in machine learning. Uh, that's one possibility to use a graph kernel to generate a feature vector representing your molecule. You could also represent your molecular graph as a sequence of characters. And there is a language called SMILES that actually encodes molecules as a sequence. It's a way of representing a graph as a sequence. So it just uh, serializes your, your graph. And then once you have your graphs represented as sequences, you can use machine learning methods that work on sequences and apply, the, apply them to that data. There is tons of work on natural language processing uh, using uh, machine learning methods on sequences. And you can just uh, build on that work here. And the last thing that we are going to see is uh, graph neural networks, which actually have uh, some uh, uh, better properties than SMILES and molecular fingerprints. And we are going to see that graph neural networks, they operate directly on the graph. So they don't really need like a feature vector or, or some, some specific representation of, of, of the molecular graph. They are just operating directly on the graph. and they have very useful properties, like they are invariant to uh, any ordering in which you specify this graph. Uh, they are, and and th that's why they, they have some uh, useful advantages. We're going, we going to see all these methods in detail in this presentation. Good. So let's uh, start with molecular fingerprints. Um, these are actually very similar to a graph kernel called the Weisfeller-Lehmann uh, Weiss graph kernel. Has anyone heard about the Weisfeller-Lehmann graph kernel? OK, some people, <laughs> uh, it's exactly that, uh, but applied to molecular graphs. And we're going to see how it works now. Um, the molecular fingerprints, uh, they are basically generated according to this algorithm. We're going to go in, the de in detail on, it, on this. But the idea is that you have a molecular graph, 
and then you are going to map that into a feature vector, and your feature vector is going to have is going to be a, a vector of binary entries. It it's going to have a particular length, um, which is given by uh, this parameter L, and then I'm going to represent each molecule now by a vector with L entries. All these entries are going to be binary, zero or one, and uh, we are going to uh, set them to one to indica indicate the presence of fragments in your graph. This, these fingerprints, they basically generate this feature vector where you have L kind of buckets, and you just switch them, or, or maybe L switches, and you switch them to one, indicating that there is a particular fragment present in this graph. So in the end, your feature vector tells you what fragments are present in the graph. And this is actually very useful to predict the properties of molecules because very often the properties of molecules are determined just by the presence of a specific fragments. So let's have a look at how we can um, generate this uh, binary feature vector. Let's assume that we have as input this graph. This works with any graph. It doesn't have to be a molecular graph. So I just <laughs> drew a toy, a toy graph here. And we have some nodes. They are connected by edges, and there is like a color associated, there is a color associated with each node. We have two nodes, for example, uh, these ones, the ones in the bottom that have the same color, but other nodes like this one, it has a different color, like, like green. And the graphs that have different colors in different nodes are going to be different, of course. Um, so um, what we are going to do is now, uh, the colors are kind of features for the, the nodes. I mean, I have used colors here, but it could be anything, any property of the node that you could think. Um, so what you're going to do is to map now the features for the nodes into some uh, integers. And this is done typically with a hashing function. Uh, many of you may have heard about hashing functions. If you have a background in computer science, these are functions that they will receive as input something, and it's going to generate a, a a, a, an integer, a number associated with that input. They are quite used for search, to speed up search, because you just have like a particular input, you generate your integer, and you go maybe to a table indexed by that integer, and then you find if, if that content is present or not. We are going to use these uh, uh, numbers generated by the hash, uh, hashing function to uh, represent our fragments in the graph. So now what we have is, at this stage, we know that there are nodes in the graph, and there are different nodes with different features. And we are encoding those fragments with these integers. And we are going to use these integers later to index our binary vector and switch on uh, those uh, entries corresponding to these fragments. Um, but these are only one atom, one node fragments. The graph contains larger fragments. So we are going to now uh, expand uh, looking from each node to its neighbors, and looking at the fragments that you can obtain by taking one step from each node. We are going to see this as follows. Uh, we are going to go uh, through several uh, steps. This uh, parameter r, this is typically called the radius, and this is going to determine the size of the largest fragments that we are going to find in our uh, graph. So we'll consider fragments up to size uh, r. And r determines the steps that you take from one node to create, th to create these fragments. All this will be more clear now in the, in the next steps. So we are going to now go through the nodes. They have each one its integer value. And we are going to concatenate uh, the identifier of the node with its neighbors and assign that list to the feature of the node. So for example, this node 5 here, it has as neighbors 2, 3, and 4. And that's what I do next. I just write the number 5, concatenate it with the values 2, 3, and 4. Uh, one question, yes? Does the order matter? Um, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it wouldn't, it, it, I mean, it dip, yeah, it wouldn't matter in this case. Um, yeah, it, it wouldn't matter. Um, so now, uh, for two, 
we see that 2 is then uh, concatenated to uh, the nodes uh, 3 and uh, 5. Okay? Um, and now we have these lists that are encoding the node and the neighbors of that node. And we're going to use again a hashing function that is going to map that into an integer. So can I have one question? Yes. Uh, does it really ma does it make sense to to use hashing when we can have learned uh, representations? Is it still like a good method to go? What do you mean by representations? Uh, by deep learning those representations instead of hashing. Right? That's what we are going to do with ah, graph okay. neural networks, <laughs> and we are going to see that graph neural networks later they do very similar operations as these uh, molecular fingerprints, but in a way that you learn uh, the representations. But at this uh, stage, this is hand-coded, and we won't be learning them. So now we're going to use our hashing function, and we map now these uh, identifiers of the nodes and their neighbors into uh, additional integers. So now we have here, for example, a node 1 that has 4 as a neighbor, and we create a new integer with our hashing function that could be 6. These integers could be the hashing function will give you like very large in, in integers, but I just write six here as an example uh, because it's easier to work with. Um, so this six now represents the fragment given by a node uh, of, of type uh, one connected to a node of, ty of type uh, four. And then we see here that we have exactly the same fragment here. Um, so we have also the in the integer uh, six. And now we have a fragment here, which is a node of type uh, 5 connected to nodes of type 2, 3, and 4. And we have an another integer representing this. And then you iterate this process. You would go next and you say, oh, you have this node of type 13 um, connected to a node of type 8, 10, and 11. And then you will, again, create another hashing uh, based on this and, and get like an index. Um, yes, one question. So, so you just ignore the type of edge? Um, with these fingerprints, uh, you do. But I mean, you could think of maybe polishing that and uh, including the, the edge type in your list, for example. You could do that, for example. Um, yes? Yeah. How was the initial hashing done, still considering the neighborhood of each node? How was initial the initial hashing done? Like the initialization for the graph, for example. Uh, I mean, you will have we had colors as the features of the nodes. That was our initialization. Uh, and the edges, they are all undirected, and they are, they are all the same. Uh, if there was anything special there, you could maybe include that as features. For example, you could say, this list could say, oh, you have a node 5 connected to 2, 3, and 4, maybe with uh, standard edges, and, uh, but maybe there's like a special edge uh, connecting uh, the node uh, 4, for example. Uh, OK, so it's not just based on topology. Can you repeat? Uh, uh, it's not just based on topology. Um, I mean, it will be based on the features. Uh, but imagine that you don't have colors. This would also work if you don't have colors. All the nodes could be the same. Uh, and initially, they would all have the same integer. Right, For example, thanks. you could just have like integer one. Good. So you just repeat this a few times until uh, r times. And then each of these fragments, they are growing. They are centered at each node in the graph, and they are growing in size. And then later, you are just going to map uh, the fragments into your binary vector. You have initially an empty vector. You take your hashing function, and then you map the integers that you obtained into locations in this uh, binary vector. So typically, the hashing integers, the integers that you get are very large, and you will use like some modulus operation to map them into a particular binary uh, entry. For example, in this case, we had these integers generated during this process, and then we just uh, switched to one, one of these bits, uh, indicating the presence of those fragments. And this resulting binary vector is your fingerprint for the molecule. It's a binary vector that tells you what fragments uh, you have. 
for example, this is going to tell you that you have uh, fragments of type one, a single atom of type one, a single node of type one, a single node of type four, five, two, three, but then you have a node of uh, type four connected to nodes of type one, one, three, and five. And all that is included in this binary vector. Um, one important thing, you could have collisions here, and that's a possibility. Um, the probability of having these collisions is low, but it can happen. Um, even though uh, you have this problem of collisions, these uh, fingerprints, these, these binary vectors that you obtain are actually very good to run machine learning methods on them. Ideally, you, would, you wouldn't want to have collisions, but uh, I mean, if you want to work with finite binary vectors, you need to, to do that. Uh, so yeah, each, each integer represents a fragment, and now we can see how the fragments are grown through this process. In your fingerprint, for each uh, atom in your molecular graph, you are going to have, for example, uh, a fragment initially, which is just that atom, there is a sulfur here, then that's uh, done at the first iteration of the algorithm. At the second iteration, you look at the neighbors of this atom, and that's going to give you this fragment here, which has uh, the one-step neighbors of the atom. Then you can go up to two steps, and you have this larger fragment, and then up to three steps, and you have this other larger fragment. And they are all mapped to different locations in your binary vector through uh, the hashing function, and you set switch those bits to one. And that's how you construct these this, uh, feature vectors representing uh, your molecular graph. It's actually a relatively simple procedure. Um, it's fast. Uh, it's kind of interpretable in the sense that if you have like a particular bit set to one, you know that there is a fragment. Uh, of a particular type present in the, in the molecular graph. And these fragments are actually very useful for making predictions because the properties of molecules, they are usually determined by the presence or absence of these fragments. Sorry. Great. Um, yes? Can you say something, what does you mean by collision? They can have a collision? Uh, about the collisions, if I can say something. No, I, I didn't get what does that mean. Yeah, so imagine, I mean, what happens is that you have these uh, fragments and you use a hashing function to map them into an entry in your binary vector. But your binary vector has maybe length uh, 1,000. Uh, so this means that you can account for 1,000 different fragments. But if you look at your molecular data set, your molecular data set is going to have a huge number of fragments, more than 1,000. This means that some fragments are going to be mapped to the same entry in your binary vector. Uh, and this means that you won't be able to distinguish between which exactly of those two fragments um, is present in the... I mean, there, there is like a bit of more complexity because each of these fragments... I mean, if you have this fragment, then all the sub-fragments are also present in your binary vector. So you will have some collisions um, between maybe some fragments, but then the smaller ones, you won't have those collisions in the end. But the, the idea with the collisions is uh, there are more fragments than entries in your binary vector, and this means that you will lose information because you are uh, you cannot really you are, you are mapping similar fragments to the same entries in the in the binary vector, and and you lose information, and this means that when you want to make predictions about the properties of the molecule, you won't be using all the information available. And that's one. That's Good. one other question. Yeah. Uh, so do you count also in hashing for, for example, uh, different properties that we may have in molecules, like the fe we can have one bonding, two bonding, three bonding, or re the rotation, different rotation? Yeah, this depends on the fingerprint that you want to use. Um, uh, and some, some of these things will be more useful or not. Uh, these are kind of generic methods. And this is also a, a limitation of fingerprints. They are hand coded. Uh, and ideally, you should be tuning these feature vectors that you obtain to the prediction problem that you want to solve. But uh, these fingerprints, they are limited because you can just, maybe you can uh, kind of change a few things, like maybe make them account for the bond, bond type and all these things. Um, but they are still, li 
limited in, in flexibility. You won't have like uh, you won't be able to to fine tune manually in the best way possible. Um, with graph neural networks, which we're going to see later, you will be tuning all these operations uh, to the to the prediction problem, and you will be able to configure the representation that you obtain uh, so that it is the best possible one when you want to make predictions based on that uh, representation for a particular property. Um, yes? So I got the part regarding how you're using repeated hashing and you're doing that R number of times to produce those integers. How yeah. do you map them to the binary vectors? I kind of lost you there. Yeah, it would be with a modulus uh, operation, for example. Typically, okay. you will choose like um, I mean, it's, it's the same as hashing, in, it's the same, the same processing. When you want to do search, fast search with hashing, you have to map uh, uh, items uh, to locations in your hash table, and it's the same, the same process. So then R and L are basically hyperparameters of your whole process? Fingerprint, yeah, that's right. This will be hyperparameters. Typically, R is not very large. Most uh, methods will use a value of R like three, for example, and that's us usually good enough to make good, to obtain good results. An L could be from thousand, maybe two thousand or so. Yeah, c m my question was about uh, the L parameter. In L parameter, sorry. Yeah. In a particular, so how how do you set it? Is it possible that you kind of set it too low and you're not able to encode your your molecule? Yeah, that's right. If L is too small, you will have more collisions, and then you will have less um, kind of uh, uh, the resolution at which you can kind of detect the differences between molecular graphs is going to be less if you reduce the, the size. But so you won't, you won't be able to, to distinguish between uh, some of the molecular graphs. So usually you will choose a large value but the problem is that if you ch choose a very large value, then your data is very high dimensional, and then learning is going to be more difficult, so there is going to be some trade-off there between like not, not L not too large, because then otherwise your dimensionality is very high and learning is more difficult, or not too low, because otherwise you don't distinguish between similar molecular graphs. Thank you. Good, um, that's great. A lot of uh, very interesting questions. Uh, Great, so let's have a look at some of the advantages on fingerprints. They are very fast to compute. It's mainly, it's mainly hashing, and this can be done very fast, and you do it only once. You have your molecular graphs, you run your fingerprint method, and then you get your feature representation. Um, it produces surprisingly, because it's very simple, but it surprisingly produces very good predictive performance. And the, the main reason is that uh, a lot of these molecular properties, as I said, they are based on the presence or absence of uh, specific fragments. They are also quite easy to interpret. They just indicate the presence or absence of fragments when you have these uh, integers uh, switched on to one uh, or zero. They have limitations as well. As I said, these are handcrafted features. It doesn't matter the predictive property that I care about, if I want to predict this property or this other one, I always use the same features. And this means that uh, these methods will be suboptimal compared to other methods that can tune the representation of the data to the prediction problem that you want to solve. And that's what neural networks do in practice, and that's what, what we will be able to solve with these graph neural networks. Um, the other thing is that they are not uh, so smooth. For example, if you have two fragments that are very similar, but they only change maybe in one atom, your hashing function is going to map them to completely different locations in your binary vector. Um, and that can be an advantage or not. It depends on the problem. Um, but I mean, it's something to, to take into account that um, Two molecules in general, uh, I mean, th the two fragments that are very similar, they, they will be mapped to very different locations in the fingerprint. Good. So we are going to see now a different uh, representation of molecules, which is based on a uh, serialization of your graph. You are going to encode your graph as a sequence. And this can be done using uh, the SMILES language. This is actually quite used uh, in, in uh, computational chemistry. SMILES comes from the initials of this simplified molecular input line entry system. It's just like a fancy name <laughs> for this. 
And the idea is that you are going to represent the molecular graph by indicating how the atoms are connected to each other. And you do it as a sequence. You will start with a, a particular atom here. You say there is this carbon atom, and it's connected with a single bond to this other carbon atom. Uh, and typically, you leave out hydrogens because you can uh, fill them in uh, very easily. So this represents a carbon atom connected to another carbon atom, and typically uh, with a single bond. And each carbon atom will have like four bonds. Uh, so you need to fill in the missing parts with hydrogens, and this will represent this molecule, which is uh, ethane. Um, you can have parentheses, which basically say this carbon is connected to the first one, but then now I add a branch, and then I see this uh, oxygen now is connected to the previous carbon, but then I close the branch when I close the parentheses, and then I have an oxygen, and the oxygen is not connected to the previous one, it's connected to where I open the parentheses. So it's just a way, the parentheses is a way of going back in the connectivity. Um, we're going to see an example visually of all these branches that will be very illustrative next. This is just a, an idea. So there are like these branches with parentheses, and there is these integers that they represent uh, circles in the sense that I, um, I have this carbon here, and I open a circle with this integer one, and when I close this circle with this integer one, it means that this carbon now is connected to the previous one where I open the, the circle or, or ring. This is just to create rings in the molecular graph. Again, we are going to see an example next of how all this works in practice. So it's actually a very simple language. It just uh, serializes your graph, and it, it writes the graph as a sequence. And uh, we're going to see uh, how it works. There are these things of uh, the, the bond type, single bonds, and implicit. And you can have this character for double bonds and this one for triple bond. Um, but let's have a look at an example, how this works. You have a molecular graph shown in the picture. And now we are going to write the SMILES sequence for this molecular graph. And we are going to start with a carbon atom here. And it corresponds to this one in the molecular graph. And we placed a carbon atom there. Now there is this digit 1, which is indicating the beginning of a ring or a circle, a ring. And at this, this means that at some point later on, I will be closing this ring by attaching something to this carbon atom. Now there is a double bond with another carbon atom uh, that is connected to the previous one. And you can see it there. Now there is another carbon atom connected to the previous one, and we are adding it in the molecular graph. Uh, now we are going to start another ring that later on we will be closing. So there is this digit 2. Now we have a double bond with a carbon atom. And now here we open a branch with the parentheses. This means that later on, when we close the branch, we will be attaching an atom to this one. We are going to see that later. Um, we have a carbon with a double bond like this. And now we are going to close the ring with this digit 1. We are going to close the ring that we opened with this other digit 1. And that will be done by adding this edge here. Now we have the digit 1. Um, and we will, we will be closing the ring. We close the ring. And now we add a sulfur atom, which is attached to the previous atom in the sequence which was this, this carbon. This is the previous one, which was this one here. Um, then you open a branch and add a, an oxygen with a double bond. You close the branch, and this means that the next atom is added not to the oxygen, but to the sulfur. Uh, we open another branch, add the oxygen. We close the branch. We add another oxygen atom. We close the branch now. And then we are going to go back. So we are closing this branch here. And we are going to go back to this point, which is this carbon atom. So the next atom, which is this one carbon, will be connected to this one here. And that's why we are adding it now 
at this location. This is the new atom, and it's connected to the previous one here. I mean, you get the idea of how this works, no? You just uh, construct serially uh, your graph uh, by encoding it as a sequence like this. You will just uh, continue, and then you just construct the whole molecular graph. Uh, it's as simple as that. You just uh, serialize your graph as a sequence. And this means that you can now run machine learning methods that work on sequences. Any ideas of machine learning methods that work on sequences? <laughs> okay, many, many, <laughs> many ideas. Uh, recurrent neural networks. You could use a recurrent neural network uh, to run on this. You have convolutional neural networks on uh, sequences as well. You could, you could apply that. You have transformer models uh, that operate on sequences. You could apply all those methods here. Um, so you just have your smile sequence. As I said, you can then uh, feed the sequence to a recurrent neural network. This could be an LSTM neural network, for example. It's going to receive a one character at a time. It updates its hidden state. And at the end, maybe like there is like a terminal uh, symbol. Uh, the hidden state of your recurrent neural network now has processed all the sequence, and it represents the sequence. And then you can use that to make predictions. You could have now a fully connected neural network that takes the hidden state of the, re of the recurrent neural network and makes a prediction of the molecular property. Um, I don't know, all the fancy things that people use in natural language processing to work with sequences, you can now use them uh, for smile sequences. Uh, you could use convolutions as well. Um, you could have a filter like this um, that receives uh, information about maybe three consecutive characters in your sequence, and you just replicate that along your sequence, and you get some feature representation. For example, here, this is the same filter replicated. You will have some pooling layers uh, to obtain some uh, representation of the whole sequence as a finite vector. Sorry, let me close this. Uh, and then you could feed that into a fully connected neural network and make predictions on the properties of, uh, of interest. Uh, the key thing is that these neural networks, they will have parameters and they will be tuned to the particular prediction problem. Uh, one question? Yes. Um, is it just this example or do we actually omit um, bond information and parentheses, et cetera, when we're training with this? If it's using the bond information. Yeah, we had some. Um, yeah, so there are going to be some characters telling you if the bonds are, I mean, by default, the bonds are single, but they could be double or triple, and there is like a character encoding that, and the neural networks operating on the sequence will be processing those. So yeah, they will be capturing that information. OK, thank you. One more question here. Uh, how, how, imp how important is the fact that Smile's representation isn't unique for your data? Does it really, do you know what is the uh, real impact of this fact? On That's training? right. Uh, That's a, a limitation of this approach. But do you know any quantitative? Uh, do you have I any mean, what you can do is uh, <laughs> you can compare these uh, methods with uh, other methods that don't use, uh, that don't have this limitation. This is a limitation of, of, of smiles. For each molecular graph, you could have different ways of encoding that graph as a sequence because, I mean, it depends on where you start. For example, uh, here we were starting at this uh, node, I think. Uh, but you could have started anywhere. And there are many sequences encoding the same molecular graph. So if you think about a machine learning method, the machine learning method, we have to learn that from data. It has to learn that actually there are many different sequences encoding the same property, and that's going to be wasteful. Uh, and later on, we are going to see graph neural networks that don't have this limitation. But yeah, sorry. But can't you make, a, for example, if you use a transformer, can't you use like a positional encoding that's like uh, rel relative instead of... Uh yeah, that's right. So transformers will be, I mean, transformers will still have to do the same thing. They will have to, I mean, you, um, yeah, I can imagine that if you use that a transformer model, uh, um, probably ignoring the positional encodings or, or with something special for the positional encodings, you could avoid these problems. And this transformer model will be very similar to a graph neural network, where you have all the nodes 
connected with each other. Uh, and people have uh, actually applied transformers to molecules, and they have uh, this uh, similarity to a graph neural network that is connected to everything with each other. And the only limitation that a transformer will have is the, ex the cost. Because everything is connected with each other, the cost is going to be higher than in other uh, graph neural networks. But, but also, uh, the I imagine these sequences can be extremely long, right? Um, I mean, it depends on the molecules. Most of the, in practice, many of these molecules are actually quite small. Okay. They are not going to be like proteins or anything. They will be like uh, drug-like molecules, and these are usually small. Good. Um, so yeah, we you can now apply neural network-like methods to sequences. Uh, so these smiles, they have some advantages and disadvantages, obviously. The advantages is it's very easy to encode the molecular graph as a sequence. This is a very simple language. Um, it's easy to understand by humans. It just tells you which nodes are connected with each other. So if you see the, the smile for a particular molecule, you kind of know already the molecule. Uh, and you can apply now all these techniques for sequences uh, to molecules. And you actually see that many people that we are working in the natural language processing uh, domain, uh, now they actually started to apply their methods to chemistry-related problems, because you can still use the same machine learning methods in this domain. Uh, they have these advantages, as we, ha as we have seen. Uh, the same molecule is represented by many different smile strings. It's the same molecule, and you have many different strings encoding that molecule. Um, so there is like a, a lack of uh, invariances. Ideally, you want your machine learning method to make always the same prediction uh, for all these possible encodings of the molecular graph with different sequences. Uh, but in practice, that's not going to be what happens. And the machine learning method will have to learn uh, on its own to do that, and that's going to be wasting uh, resources. Uh, there is something called canonical smiles which uh, for any particular molecular graph is going to choose always like a particular way to encode the graph. Um, so they could somehow at least guarantee that you always have like a fixed representation for any molecular graph, but uh, still you are not kind of fully solving the problem because the, um, the, the machine learning method is not capturing the, the invariances present in the, in the graph. No, in the graph, the graph is basically the same. It doesn't matter how I start to construct the graph. No? And uh, if I choose an ordering to construct the graph or another one, the graph is the same and my prediction should be the same. But these uh, methods based on smiles don't capture that. The other limitation of smiles is that you have some discrepancy between, for example, um, distance in the sequence and distance in the graph. And we saw that before in the example in the example here, for example, we have this node here um, that is actually, this is a carbon atom, and I think it was, uh, I, don't know if I think it was this one. Um, and in the sequence, it's very close to this oxygen, which was actually this one here. So you have things that are very close in the sequence, but they are far away in the molecular graph. Um, and it could be the same thing. Things that are close in the molecular graph are far away in the sequence. Um, and this can create problems when maybe some patterns that are important for the property of the molecule um, could be, for example, the how two, o two atoms are close to each other, for example. The same thing as what we said before, like these fragments. Maybe you care that there is this particular fragment, but maybe your fragment is broken in your smile string. And then all these methods based on smiles will struggle to find, for example, those relevant fragments uh, for prediction. And that can be a problem with these methods. Um, so you have these uh, uh, short range dependencies in the molecular graph that are transformed into long range dependencies in the sequence. And that usually uh, machine learning methods, they struggle with these long uh, range dependencies. Good, so we are going to see now uh, an approach that addresses the limitations of these methods that we have seen before, uh, and it's based on graph neural networks. Has anyone seen this before? Has, is anyone familiar with graph neural networks? Okay, quite a lot of people are <laughs> familiar with this. 
So maybe we can go a bit quick on this uh, part. Um, I mean, the idea of the graph neural network is that now you are going to run a neural network directly on the graph. And the computations that the neural network is going to be doing are going to be determined by the graph structure. And the result is that we will, we will have a method that now is invariant uh, to the way you, com you construct your, your graph. It's going to be invariant to the ordering in the nodes, and uh, it's not going to really care much about the distances between atoms. It's not going to have this uh, long range, short range uh, problem that we saw in the sequences. And the idea is that we are going to work directly with graphs using these graph neural networks uh, to do the computations directly on the graph. So instead of taking the graph, finding some feature representation like the sequence or the fingerprint, and then running machinery methods on that representation, we are going to operate directly on the, on the graph. Um, uh, these graph neural networks are actually re very old. Um, they have been, uh, I mean, it was in the 2000s or so, people were already proposing them even earlier than that. The main difference is that in the past, Computing the gradients in a graph neural network was extremely painful. It was very difficult to obtain the gradients. Um, and even though people proposed these graph neural networks uh, quite a long time ago, no one was able to really train them well. They had like hacky ways to obtain approximate gradients just to simplify the computations of gradients. Um, in about 2016 is when you started to have automatic differentiation tools um, in machine learning, you had all these uh, deep uh, learning toolboxes. Um, they started like with things like, for example, Theano and other things like, all, all this is probably super old because <laughs> no one uses these things now. Um, but you started to, to have automatic differentiation tools and that allowed people to obtain exact gradients with graph neural networks. And that's when graph neural networks exploded in popularity because it was very easy to use them and they actually worked very well. Uh, so there are many different papers. I'm going to give here a brief description of graph neural networks given by uh, Bataglia. And the key thing is that uh, there are tons and tons of graph neural network uh, methods. Um, but they all have kind of similar uh, inner workings and we're going to represent all of them in a common way. Um, and what we're going to do is now uh, make use of the following vectorial variables. We're going to have now vectors uh, encoding the, the features for the, for the edges in our graph. We're going to call these vectors E. We're going to have vectors encoding the features for the nodes. We're going to call those vectors V. And then we're going to have some global features uh, summarizing the graph. And this would be a feature vector that encodes the graph. And it's going to give you like a representation of the graph that is invariant to any ordering in which you specify the graph. Um, the idea is that then to it update these variables iteratively during a forward pass of our graph neural network. So your graph neural network is going to take the values of the features for the nodes and the edges, and it's going to update them based on the graph connectivity. We are going to use this graphical notation to represent the variables. All these are going to be feature vectors, and we have the feature vectors for the, the edges, like this, feature vectors for the nodes, and the global features, u. And uh, given a particular molecular graph, like this one, this would be, um, this is a carbon atom. I think this is a carbon atom as well. And this is uh, oxygen and oxygen. You obtain now a graph which has four nodes, one per atom. And now we have uh, all these edges. The edges are undirected. So you have both uh, edges in, in each direction, connecting one node with another one, node one and node four, and node four and node one. Uh, you have the features for the the edges, the features for the nodes, and the global features. And then we are going to be updating all these var variables uh, iteratively um, based on the features for the nodes and the edges. We update the global features and so on. And then based on the global features, we also update the other nodes. And then we make some predictions for the target. 
based on the global features. Uh, the, edge, the edge features could be initialized to the atom type. The node features could be initialized to the atom type uh, as well. You could also add additional features, like for example, uh, maybe the electronegativity of the atom, uh, maybe the degree of, of the atom, how it is connected in the graph, and so on. Um, good. So we are going to be operating with these variables. Yes, one question. Uh, how, how do you update the the vectors? So what are you like? We are going to see this next. Yes, we are going to see there are some operations there that are determined by the graph connectivity and it's going to determine how the vectors are uh, updated. One of the key things that we need to uh, use when we work with graph neural networks is that the predictions of our networks, they have to be invariant to ordering. So you need to make use of functions that are invariant to ordering. And these are usually called set functions because it's like if you have a function that operates on a set, it can receive as input a variable number of arguments and it's invariant to the order in which these arguments are um, provided. So for example, you may have a function that receives as input these vectors, one, two, three, and it generates an output. And you want this function to receive also maybe a different number of inputs, like f vectors now four and five that are different, and it generates a different output. Um, but now if you permute the order in the arguments provided to this function, the output should be the same. So these two outputs here, they are the same. Um, and you want functions that have these properties. Uh, and it turns out that there are a few ones uh, for example, you can just sum up the vectors that are provided as an input, and the sum is invariant to ordering, and it can receive a variable number of inputs. No? If you receive three vectors, you just sum the three vectors, but if you receive four vectors, you sum the four vectors, and you get another vector as output. You have the sum, the mean, uh, the maximum operation, all these, they have these properties, and they are used by these graph neural networks. Now, uh, we are going to use the set functions to, pro to generate summaries of the variables. Uh, one question, yes. Uh, do you have to normalize after summation? Um, normalize in what way? No, sorry. It kind of divides, yeah. So the, the difference, for example, between summation and mean is that the mean divides by the number of inputs. Oh, okay. So if you think about maybe normalizing, maybe the mean would be kind of the, <laughs> the thing that is normalizing uh, things. Okay, okay. Um, good. Uh, some of these va of these functions they will have advantages and disadvantages. Um, um, but yeah, the set functions they will be used to create summaries of uh, some variables in the graph. For example, we are going to create a summaries of the features incoming to a particular node. And we're going to represent this with this variable with a bar here. This is a summary of the edge features that are incoming to the node uh, i. And you could just sum the features of these edges. Um, and that will create your summary. You're going to create a summary of uh, all the edges which we call E with a bar and a summary of all the nodes. And uh, based on these summaries, then we will be updating again the, the values of some of the vectors. We are going to see in, a, uh, in an algorithm how all this works visually. Uh, so we are going to use now these auxiliary variables that summarize the incoming edge vectors to a node, all the edge vectors in the graph and all the node vectors in the graph. So we have our graph like this. We had the features for the nodes, features for the edges, global features, and now we have summaries of incoming edges to a node and uh, summaries of node features and summaries of edge features. So um, as I mentioned, you can summarize, for example, uh, the edge features to the fourth node. For example, this is the summary this is the summary of the edge features to the fourth node, and then you take this edge that is incoming to the fourth node, this edge, and this edge, and you just uh, summarize that into a vector. Uh, and you may have a, a, a similar, similar summary for the first uh, node. 
which basically just contains this um, the summary of this single feature. You have a summary for all the edges in the graph that receives as input all the edge features and a summary of all the node features in the graph. And uh, these set functions in graph neural networks, they are very similar to pooling operations in convolutional neural networks. In convolutional neural networks, you typically have some filters, and then you will take the value of uh, some filters that are close in a space, and then you will do some pooling like max uh, or sum, and they are kind of summarizing information, and here it's more or less the same. Good, so we are about to finish now the description of all the operations that our graph neural network is doing. Besides these summaries, we also have update functions, and the update functions are just going to update the values of the features for the edges and the features for the nodes based on all these variables. For example, you can update the feature for the edge connecting node J and K based on the previous value of that feature, and now maybe the, the node features uh, for those nodes that are connected by the edge and maybe you also receive as input the summary of the graph, u. So this is just saying, I have this edge here, connected, connecting node one and node four, and I just uh, update the, the feature vector for that edge as a function of the feature vectors for the nodes. You can do the same for the node features. You update the value of the node, feature as a function of the summary of its incoming edges here, the previous value of the node, and the global um, uh, feature vector. And then finally, you could uh, update the global feature, the global summary, sorry, the global feature vector for the graph, u, as a function of the summary of the edges, the summary of the nodes, and the previous value of the, of the, feature vector for the graph. We are going to see now how all this is done iteratively in a forward pass in the graph neural network. Um, ah yeah, one important thing. All these update functions, they are typically reused. It's like in a conf net that you have a filter and you will be uh, translating your filter across your image and the filter has the same weights and you just reuse the same value of the weights. Here is the same. The function that you use to update the edge features is going to be the same for all the different edge edges. And the function that updates the node features here um, is going to be the same, again, for all the different uh, nodes. So let's have a look at how the forward pass works in a graph neural network, also visually. You have in the bottom, visually, all the variables uh, associated with the graph the node features, the edge features, the summary of incoming edges, um, and then the summary of nodes, uh, the summary of edges, and the, the global feature for the graph. We start by updating the edge features. So we go through all the edges, and then update the features for those edges by looking at the features of the nodes that are connected, and the global features for the graph and the previous value of the edge feature. So we do that for all the edge features, like this, iteratively. And now once we, are, once we are done updating the features for the edges, we are going to summarize the information for uh, the incoming edges to each node. So we go to the first node, and then we summarize the features for the incoming edges, and it's only one in this case, so we don't really need to do much. Uh, and then we update the feature value for the node. Given its summary, so we have updated here the summary of uh, incoming edges, and uh, then given that summary and the node feature and the global feature for the graph, I update the feature for the node. And then you repeat this process. I go to another node, I update its summary of incoming edges, and then I update the node feature. Yes. Yeah. Um, so could you could you comment a bit on the convergence property, at least at the, in this application? Uh, Can you repeat? Uh, uh, comment on the convergence property. Convergence, convergence. Does it always what? converge? Does it have difficulties? Is it stable? 
if this yeah, application? That's a good question. Uh, so right now you only uh, uh, perform these uh, operations once, so it doesn't really to convert to anything. It's just like saying you have a neural network, it receives some input, and it goes through its uh, maybe one hidden layer, and the one hidden layer generates an output. And this is basically what this is doing. Uh, you could apply it many times, and obviously uh, things could happen <laughs> there. Uh, I'm not an expert on, on uh, a specific expert on graph neural networks. Uh, Michael Bronstein is going to give a talk uh, tomorrow. He knows way more on that. Um, but typically, one problem with these graph neural networks is that if you repeat this process many times, uh, the information in the graph is kind of washed away. Um, and uh, that's a limitation with, with graph neural networks. Typically, you will have to propagate information in the graph by running this process many times, uh, but uh, that can create problems. Um, I'm not an expert in this area. There are some results on uh, trying to create, for example, um, versions of graph neural networks that will be kind of uh, stable. Uh, because if you run this process many times, what could happen is that maybe things go, um, I don't know, they could diverge, or it could uh, maybe go to zero, for example, and you maybe want things to stay stable. And there are people working on graphene networks that have those properties. Um, so far, we are going to assume that you, you perform these updates only a few times, maybe three times or so, and then you don't have to worry about that. It will be just like a neural network that receives some input, it goes through maybe three hidden layers, and it generates some output. Uh, but if you run this process many times, you could run into these these issues that I I mentioned. Um, yes. So, what are the properties of an update function? So, for a set uh, for a, a summary function, you have set functions that are invariant. What are the properties that are? Uh, they are just nonlinear functions. It could be. A and it could network. be anything. Yeah, it could be anything. Typically, you will use, uh, f for example, neural networks. They could be fully connected neural networks, and they will have some parameters, and you will be fine-tuning those parameters. Thank you. Good. Um, so you perform this process where you update the summary of the incoming edges, and then you update the node features. Um, and then you update the summaries of the edges for the graph and then the summary of the nodes for the graph, and based on those, you update the global uh, features for the graph, U, and then uh, you will be making some predictions based on those global features for the, for the graph. And this could be done with a fully connected neural network, for example. Uh, this is only one forward pass, uh, but typically, you just want to repeat this process many times, because what happens is that here, uh, this node, it's updating its features using the summary of incoming edges, which looks at the edges uh, incoming to that node, and those edges were updating, updated, looking at the features for the neighboring nodes. So if you think about this, the information is actually propagated in a similar way as the fingerprints. We saw the fingerprints at the beginning, and you were taking the features for a node, the integer associated with a node, and the integers for the neighbors, and then creating a new integer based on that using your hashing function. The graph neural network is doing something similar. It's looking at the features of the neighbors, is updating the, fe the edge uh, features based on that, on those uh, values of the neighboring nodes, and then based on that, it updates the value of the node in particular. So it's doing something very similar. It's just lo looking at the features of the neighbors, getting that information into the edge features, and then transmitting that information into the, the node uh, for which those edges are incoming. So it's very similar to the molecular fingerprints, but now the operations are based on functions with weights that you can tune. Um, and that's why I said that you can actually learn the resulting features by tuning these weights, and you can personalize your features to the prediction problem that you care about. So this is only one step, but you, you could repeat this several times, 
And this means that you will have different layers now in your graph neural network. Um, so what is happening now? Um, what's, what happens through this process, these are these are this process that I described, this forward pass in the graph neural network is a way of uh, passing messages in the graph. You start with a particular node that has its feature vector, and after one step, the feature vector for that node has been updated using information from the feature vectors for the neighboring nodes. And now this feature vector for this node now summarizes this part of the graph. It's the same as the fragments that we saw with the fingerprints, but now you have feature vectors summarizing this part of the, of the graph. Now, after two forward passes, the feature vector for this no node now contains information about this part of the graph. And then after three uh, passes, then this feature vector for the node contains more information. So it's kind of similar to the fingerprints. Now, each feature vector for the node summarizes a part of the graph, a fragment, but in a way that has been tuned to the prediction problem at hand by adjusting the weights in your update functions. Good. Any question on this uh, so far? Maybe one. Uh, did you put a molecular fingerprint in U? Like um, to give the global structure of... A molecular fingerprint where? To put it where? As vector U, like global information about the graph. Uh, I mean, you could understand this U vector as a fingerprint. Uh, it's not that you put the, the fingerprint there. I mean, like it's initialization, I mean. Ah, the initialization. Like uh, the, the first yeah, step? Yeah, you could do that. I don't know if anyone has done that. Uh, maybe it helps. Uh, you, you could do that, yes. That's right. Um, good. Uh, there are tons of uh, graph neural network methods. They all differ uh, in the way you implement these update functions and set functions that I described. For example, uh, this one uses as update function for the edge just a linear function. Um, and the update function for the node is a recurrent neural network. Um, this one as a update function for the edge. Here it uses a fully connected neural network. The update function for the node is also a fully connected neural network. I know you have many different flavors of this. They're actually quite similar. And uh, there was actually a recent paper uh, by some uh, friends of mine at Microsoft Research. I mean, they were at Microsoft Research. They are, they are no longer there uh, in, in Cambridge, Microsoft Research in Cambridge. They took all these different uh, graph neural network methods. They did exhaustive hyperparameter tuning, and they looked at their performance, and they were all similar. <laughs> So in the end, uh, most of these methods, they are quite similar. It only depends on how you tune them. Uh, there are different codes. I won't spend much time on this because this is a bit old, but there is like usually quite a lot of available code to, to implement this. Let's have a look at how these methods perform, comparing uh, the different methods. Yes. Um, so in PNNs, use RNNs to update the nodes. Um, then they are not permutation invariant RNNs? Uh, no, because you, you still have the set functions. The permutation invariant is given by the set functions that it doesn't matter. For each node, you process the information from the neighbors, and that's where you wash away the ordering information. But here you use the RNN. The RNN is uh, to say the value of the node um, i, the new value of the node feature for node i, is obtained as a function of the previous uh, value of the node um, and the DH uh, feature. Um, and there is like a hidden state in the recurrent neural network. So you could say this is a recurrent neural network that receives uh, two inputs, the previous value of the node uh, feature and the, the summary of incoming edges, and it generates an output. And then you feed to the network its output uh, again. Um, if I if I understand this well, uh, maybe I, I'm, it could be that this is the hidden state of the recurrent neural network. I'm not fully sure. So you just have a recurrent neural network 
that is going to receive uh, the, the updated summary of the edges as input, and it's going to update its hidden state and maybe output the, the new value of the, 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 feature, the, the new feature vector for the node. But it's used as internally as a way to process information. And it accounts for um, all the previous feature vectors for the node through different uh, forward passes. Because you have these layers, you could say this was the feature vector for the node in the previous, in the first pass, in the second pass, in the third pass. All that's uh, fed as an input to the recurrent neural network. OK. Yeah. Good. Any other question? Let's have a look at how this works in practice. So uh, this is from uh, this paper by David Dubino, which was one of the first, uh, probably the first uh, uh, graph neural network that was uh, trained using automatic differentiation tools. And it compares fingerprints with graph neural networks. And they show that graph neural networks are better because they learn these features, uh, obviously. So you have now here uh, fingerprints, which are these two rows. And then the graph neural network here. These are different problems, predicting the solubility of molecules, predicting how effective a drug-like molecule is to treat malaria. And this is predicting the uh, uh, power conversion efficiency for photovoltaics. Uh, and you see that this uh, method with the uh, graph neural network, they were calling them neural fingerprints because they are very similar to fingerprints uh, at that point. At that point, they were calling them uh, neural fingerprints. Anyway, they work better than fingerprints, graph neural networks. Uh, this is another example of this message passing uh, graph neural networks um, from this uh, paper here. And it shows that it works uh, quite well, predicting all these are, these are all different properties. This is the QM9 data set, I think. And you have all these different properties of the molecules. And uh, you look at the error of the graph neural network on each row. And you can see that uh, this message passing in neural network works quite well. When you see a table like this in a machine learning paper, you start to be a bit suspicious. Because this method is best in every single <laughs> problem. Uh, they compare with fingerprints. Here, all these are hand engineered features, including these fingerprints in this location, and these are other graph-based uh, uh, neural networks. Uh, this is related to what I said about fine-tuning hyperparameters. <laughs> I don't know if these guys, they fine-tuned all the hyperparameters very well, because they're comparing here with other graph neural networks. And when you do exhaustive hyperparameter tuning, they're all quite similar. Um, good. Uh, so yeah, graph neural networks work, work quite well. Uh, you can compare methods based on its miles and graph neural networks. Uh, and this is uh, done on uh, two data sets. One is the SYNC data set, which has about a quarter million molecules. Um, and then um, you have uh, molecules from this QM9 data set. The molecules in QM9 are usually smaller because they are only based on nine heavy atoms. Uh, and we compare uh, a confnet on the smiles and a graph neural network similar to the one uh, that I mentioned before. That was the first one. Um, um, and you show performance here. You predict different properties. In sync, you predict solubility and QED, which are some simple properties. They are actually quite easy to predict. Um, and here in QM9, you predict more complicated uh, properties. But you actually see that uh, the method based on smiles works quite well on the small molecules. And on larger ones, uh, the graph neural network performs better. Uh, I mean, the graph neural network is quite similar to the smiles uh, as well. Um, but at least it, it shows that the smiles, they can also do quite well in these small molecules. If you have larger molecules, like the ones in sync, uh, performance deteriorates here. You can see that it's, it seems to be worse. Um, and this could be related to this long range thing that I mentioned at the beginning. You have larger molecules, uh, the smile sequences are going to be larger, and you could have like the smile sequence 
just breaks down the molecule in different ways. Um, yes, some question? Yeah. But you could have like uh, attention that looks at. That's right. So if in the end it's a, it's a problem with a uh, CNN, uh, that's right. Because I mean, <laughs> uh, the CNN the, the smiles tells you the graph, and from the graph you can also run the graph neural network. So it's just uh, the method that you use to to process the uh, the data. And the problem is is here with the CNN because it's not it's not exploiting this uh, invariances and and it, it's based on this. A sequential representation of the molecule. Uh, you could imagine having a transformer-like method uh, operating on the smiles, and that's probably going to be quite good because the transformer is going to look at all the co uh, potential dependencies between parts in the sequence. One more question. Can you comment on how uh, these compare to other newer string-based representations like selfies and such? Yeah, uh, so there are different ways to <laughs> to represent molecules. There is this uh, representation based on selfies. Um, I think the main advantage of selfies is that, uh, I mean, selfies is like a smiles, but uh, one of the problems with a smiles is that um, you may generate a sequence um, with with smiles and it doesn't uh, translate into a valid molecule uh, because, for example, you have parentheses, you have these uh, rings that you have to close, and imagine that you have a digit one, but then there is no no other digit one in your sequence. Then that's not really. You say you are opening a ring, but you don't close it, or you could close it like twice, for example. You run into these problems. Uh, smiles is a language that has been designed in a way that you don't have these limitations. And you can guarantee that you have a uh, selfies sequence, and it's going to be a valid molecule. Uh, so in that sense, I think it's going to be better if you want to generate new molecules. And selfies has be have been used quite a lot for generative modeling. Uh, for predic prediction of properties, uh, I'm not fully sure how much could be the advantage. Uh, there could be some differences, but I, I wouldn't be able to say exactly what. Good. Um, Maybe just to conclude, uh, some uh, advantages and disadvantages of graph neural networks. Advantages, they are invariant to order. Uh, so it doesn't matter how you specify the graph, what order you say for the nodes, uh, the prediction is invariant to that. Uh, and that's not something that happens with uh, smiles. No, In the smiles, I just change the smile sequence. It's the same molecular graph, but the prediction of my model will change. They will generate uh, features. Uh, using a da data-driven approach. The features that you will obtain for your graph, they change uh, depending on your prediction problem. If you want to predict this power conversion efficiency, the feature encoding is going to be different than if you want to predict uh, effectiveness against malaria, for example. They work quite well. Uh, probably they are state-of-the-art. When you have quite a lot of data, um, actually fingerprints, they are extremely good if you don't have a lot of data. They're going to be way better than graph neural networks. Um, so that's why fingerprints are still quite useful. If you have a data set with maybe 100 data points or 300 data points, fingerprints would be still uh, better than graph neural networks because you don't have enough data to train your networks. Uh, disadvantages of graph neural networks. They usually have like a typically higher computational cost than, for example, fully connected networks. Now there is a lot of very good uh, optimized software for graph neural networks, so this disadvantage is not so big. Typically, the way this works is that you create like a very large graph with many molecules, and you will process all uh, in parallel, like in a vectorized way, and that's going to uh, speed up computations quite a lot. Uh, these set functions that you are also uh, applying at each step to summarize the information in coming to a node they wash away information. And you can show that these uh, graph neural networks are actually inefficient, uh, and they have some limitations. I won't go much into the details, details of that, but ideally, you don't want to remove information within each individual step of your processing. You would like to remove 
information on the ordering at the end of all your processing operations. Uh, and that guarantees that you don't wash away information uh, within each individual step. You only do it at the end when you want to have like something that is invariant. There are people working on new versions of graph linear networks that don't have these problems. Um, the difficulty is that you have higher cost if you don't want to uh, this wash, wash away this information when you process information for each uh, node. Uh, so that's all. May um, I have a question? Yeah. Uh, about this higher computational cost. That's obvious to me, but from your uh, experience in practice on molecules, does it really matter? Because uh, as far as I understand it, for us in the chem informatics or something like that, we just want to the correct answers, not like answers in uh, milliseconds or something like that. Yeah, uh, it's, I mean, it's the main thing is for training. I think for prediction, probably it doesn't make much of a difference. Uh, you could imagine of uh, generating fingerprints mm -hmm. and then uh, running a fully connected neural network on the fingerprints. That's going to be faster than yeah, the graph neural networks. Easy. But, uh, but they are going to be still doable, I mean, the graph neural ne networks. It's, it's just that they are going to be slower than fingerprints with a fully connected neural ne network. OK, cool. Good. So I think we can have now a break for the coffee, and then we can come back and uh, look yeah. at the next part of the presentation. Yeah, thanks. So many yeah. thanks. So in this uh, second part, I'm going to focus on some of the work done in my research group uh, on the molecules. Um, and uh, first, I'm going to uh, focus on deep generative models. And if we have some time, we'll talk about the uh, meta-learning uh, methods uh, for molecules as well. Good. So deep generative models for molecules. What are deep generative models? Uh, they are going to be neural networks that are going to receive some tractable noise distribution as input, uh, as shown in this figure. The neural network then is going to uh, transform this noise into some uh, uh, complicated distribution and its output that is going to try to approximate a, a target that is going to be also uh, quite complicated. Um, and the, um, the idea is that you can train them from data or from uh, values of this uh, target probability. And uh, once you have trained them, then you can generate synthetic data from these models. And the data is going to have similar properties uh, as the one that was used to train the models. And you can do also density evaluations and other things that can be useful for things that we will see later. Uh, so we're going to be focusing on this. There are different families of uh, generative models. Um, and we'll, we'll have like a short introduction to, to them. Um, the particular uh, examples or applications of these models that we're going to focus is on finding new optimal properties. We're going to use generative models to find new molecules with uh, improved properties. And I will tell you uh, today here about a deep generative model of molecules that works via chemical reactions. It's going to generate new molecules by applying chemical reactions in a way so that it's going to tell you this is a new molecule and this is how to synthesize that molecule in practice. Um, and we're going to use those models for molecule optimization. The other uh, application is to approximate the Boltzmann distribution uh, of molecules. Molecules are actually not uh, rigid. Uh, you have the atoms in 3D space, and they will be having some uh, uh, vibrations and movements, and the locations of the atoms will follow some particular distribution. And this can be quite useful uh, for drug design, for example. Uh, if you know if a particular uh, drug-like molecule is going to bind to a target protein or not. Um, uh, I have an example uh, animation here. This is from the Disho research and you have like a bigger molecule it could be a protein and uh, it's going to uh, it's not rigid it's going to be moving uh, and you have like a drug like molecule that can be in different configurations and you are interested in in see if the drug like molecule is going to attach to a target site or not um, so you could approximate all these distributions with deep generative models 
Uh, we'll see more on that later. Um, so a few examples of generative models. Uh, probably a very simple way to create a generative model for data is to follow an autoregressive approach. And the idea is that you can factorize a joint distribution using the product rule. You write it as a product of uh, some uh, variable uh, given uh, the others. So you will fix an ordering of your variables, and then you will uh, write a conditional probability for the next variable given the others. Um, and each of these factors, typically, this is going to be a tractable um, This is going to be a tractable distribution. It could be a distribution uh, that could be categorical if you are working on uh, discrete sequences, for example, or uh, continuous. It could be like a mixture of Gaussians, for example. Um, and the key thing is that now you have like a closed form uh, expression for the probability given by your model to the data, and you could do maximum likelihood learning and many other things. Um, the key thing is how to model these conditionals. And there are many ways to do this. Uh, a simple approach is to use uh, recurrent neural networks. You could have a recurrent neural network that receives as input maybe the first variable, uh, and it outputs, uh, um, sorry, it's going to output the, the conditional distribution for the different variables. So you maybe start by generating a distribution for the first variable x1, and then given the sample of x1, you generate a distribution for x2, and so on. And the hidden state represents the, the values that you have seen so far until you generate the distribution for the last uh, variable. This is a very simple approach. Uh, another type of uh, generative model that is quite popular is variational autoencoders. I assume most people are familiar with these things here. No? A lot of people are familiar with variational autoencoders. Good. <laughs> Uh, so variational autoencoders, the key thing is that they have like uh, latent variables. And typically, you assume that there is like a low dimensional space with these latent variables um, set. And then you use a neural network to map those values of set into a distribution over the high dimensional data. Um, you can train these models efficiently using uh, variational inference, using recognition networks. Um, I won't go much into the details of this. Later on, we will see how you can do uh, mapping of these uh, molecules and their synthesis graphs into latent space. And you can uh, make a small space, a small changes of the latent variables in a variational autoencoder model. And you can have the model decoding uh, uh, new molecules that are synthesized in a similar way as, as the previous ones. We are going to do. Um, interpolation in, in latent space between synthesis uh, paths for molecules. So you can have a uh, variation of encoders, but another type of generative model that is quite uh, used, useful in practice is normalizing flows. Um, normalizing flows uh, have the main advantage that uh, they provide you a tractable uh, density and sampling is uh, fast. It's not like autoregressive models that usually you sample one dimension at a time, and this involves uh, several uh, steps that could be, uh, and I, it could be slow, you just generate all the variables uh, at once. And the idea in normalizing flows is that you have a simple distribution, uh, T, and then you apply an invertible nonlinear transformation um, to the, samples from this distribution, and you get a new variable y uh, that follows a more complicated distribution as the one shown here. And because the function is invertible, you obtain right away density values. And typically, uh, the density values are efficiently computed. They are given by this expression. So the log density of the transformed variables is the log density of the original variables, and then there is this extra term here that depends on the Jacobian of your transformation. Um, this is just the standard change of variables rule. Um, I won't, again, I won't go much into the details of this because it's, uh, it's more, I, I'm going to focus more on the application of these methods to specific problems. Um, 
Good, so we are going to be using these methods uh, to solve some problems related to molecules. And the first uh, approach that we are going to focus on is to uh, do molecule optimization using uh, synthesis-aware deep generative models of molecules. And this can be useful for finding new, new molecules with useful properties, um, for example, like new drugs. Um, there is tons of work on generative models of molecules. Uh, you could just use a, an autoregressive model like uh, the recurrent neural network that we have seen. You can train it on smile sequences, and you could generate new uh, molecules by by just sampling from this recurrent neural network, and it's going to just generate new smile sequences corresponding to new molecular graphs. You could have a data set of molecules that are good for a particular problem. You could feed your recurrent neural network to that data, and then you could generate new molecules that are going to be different from the ones in your data, but um, could exhibit similar properties. So there are tons of work on generative models that generate uh, new molecules, but ideally we want a generative model that tells you how to synthesize the molecule in practice. It doesn't generate the molecule uh, on its own, that it, this product, but it's going to tell you that the molecule can be synthesized by combining uh, two reactants, for example. The advantage of this is that now you have a generative model that generates <coughs> molecules via chemical reactions, and uh, uh, the generated molecules are going to be more likely to be synthesizable in practice, you know, because if you have this recurrent neural network, that recurrent neural network will generate some molecules, but maybe there is no way to, to obtain those molecules in practice. You have the synthesis information right away. Uh, there are approaches to do search for how to find this uh, uh, synthesis uh, route for a new molecule. But you will have to do that search, and uh, maybe there is no way you can find a synthesis route for a, one of the generated molecules. And another advantage is that these models, they tend to generate a lot of garbage. Uh, they will generate crazy molecules that have maybe uh, that are very unrealistic, and they wouldn't exist in the real world. When you generate molecules via chemical reactions, actually, it's way more likely that uh, your molecules are uh, realistic and they could exist in the real world and they could uh, be synthesized. And that's uh, some of the properties that we find with the models that uh, I'm going to describe now that, that work in this way. Um, so how does uh, our approach work to generate molecules via chemical reactions? Uh, we are going to encode a reaction as a directed uh, acyclic graph, as uh, the one shown here. This is the graph, uh, the synthesis graph for paracetamol. And it contains some existing molecules that are uh, directly available and that you could purchase, and they are shown here in light blue. These are called building blocks, and they represent already existing molecules. Um, and we assume that we have access to those. We can combine them to obtain intermediate products, which would be these uh, nodes in green. And at the end, you will get the molecule of interest, which is this uh, final product, uh, paracetamol. So we are going to assume that we have uh, data in this form, and we are going to train generative models that will generate data in, in this form. This is a directed acyclic graph, and each node in the graph, it's a molecular graph on its own. Um, so our model is going to generate this uh, directed, directed acyclic graphs of molecular graphs, and we call them these uh, dogs, and that's why we call our model uh, dog. Uh, it's <laughs> just a fancy name, uh, yes. So a reaction is not just combining two molecules, right? There are also like reaction conditions and other things. That's right, yes. Are those embedded in the edges we, or something? We are ignoring those parts here. But uh, yeah, we just assume that there are some uh, additional variables that, that you would have to take into account. But yeah, we're ignoring that information at this, at this stage. Um, so it turns out that there is uh, a lot of uh, data available, in particular in this uh, USPTO data set, it contains about 70,000 
uh, th synthesis DAX. This is data extracted from the US uh, Patent Office. Uh, it was done in an automatic way. And you could use this data to train a model. And that's actually what we did. Um, we are going to now synthesize these molecules, uh, uh, synthesis DAX, uh, cellularizing them. We're going to start constructing them based on the, their individual components. As I said, you have these building block nodes and intermediate product nodes. So we're going to have a model. This is going to be a type of uh, autoregressive model, as the one I mentioned before. And uh, you will start by taking some actions. And the actions are, for example, to start with an empty building block node. You say, this is going to be one of the purchasable molecules that I have available. And I will have to choose uh, the content of this node. And maybe I say, from my library of candidate molecules, this is the one that I choose. Uh, then you will take an action, and it could be create another empty building block node. And I'm going to fill in the content then from my library of purchasable molecules. Then my next action could be to create an intermediate product node. Right now it is empty. Um, and I will have to determine which uh, building block nodes or, or previous nodes in my graph I connect it to. I could say I'm going to connect it to the first node that I created. I'm, to, I'm going to connect it to the second node that I created, and then that's it. I stop making connections. And once I, ha I stop, then I will have to fill in the content of this node. Uh, for this, you need to use a reaction prediction method. There are many different methods to do this. Something that works very well is called uh, the molecular transformer. The molecular transformer works based on sequences. These smiles that we mentioned before is going to receive as input a sequence with the smiles of the products in, sorry, the, the reactants in your reaction. And then the output of the transformer is going to be another sequence with uh, the product. Um, you could use this molecular transformer to predict the content of this node, and then you will take now actions, maybe uh, introduce the, uh, another empty building block node, you fill in it, its content, you introduce an intermediate product node, you say I'm going to connect it to uh, node 3, node 4, and then I stop and fill in its content, another empty building block node, choose from my library of candidate uh, purchasable molecules one, another empty building block node, and then I say this is the last node, it's going to be the root of my uh, graph, and I just connect the nodes that don't have any descendants, I connect them to, to that one. And I fill in the content. And this is now a way in which you can generate these synthesis graphs one step at a time. So uh, yes. maybe I missed it, but uh, at uh, how do you code the information about to which uh, molecule should you pin the new, uh, new element, new building block? Yeah, I didn't uh, specify that yet. So these are kind of the actions, uh, but you're going to have a graph neural network based models that are going to be uh, looking at the history of the actions that you took and the current graph, uh, and they will generate some probability distribution uh, over all your library of purchasable molecules. Maybe your library has uh, thousands of elements. So you will give now a probability for each of these elements to be uh, filling in the content of this node. We are going to see later a, a picture trying to illustrate this. Um, good, so you just have this sequence of actions and you just basically have to uh, specify a probability distribution for the next action based on the previous ones. Uh, so we're going to use this autoregressive model that is going to generate this synthesis uh, uh, graph one step at a time. And for that, we're going to use a recurrent neural network. Uh, the recurrent neural network is, uh, is, is receiving as input the previous actions. Uh, we're going to generate embeddings for all the molecules in our graph uh, using graph neural networks. So uh, the whole thing will work as follows. We are also using autoencoders. So we will have like some latent variables uh, that are low dimensional that uh, determine the 
synthesis graph that we will be generating. So we feed as an input to our recurrent network um, the initial latent variables, and then the RNN is going to specify a probability distribution over the uh, content of the building block node. The, the initial action is always, um, the, the first action is to fill in the content of an empty building block node because you don't have anything <laughs> uh, at this stage. And maybe you choose this one. No, you, you generate this. Um, you, you fill in the content of the graph, of the node with this graph, and then you will have some uh, embedding that is uh, fed as to the neural network. Um, basically, this represents uh, the information from the uh, current graph that you have uh, so far. Now it's just a building block node with a particular element. And then you need to choose the next action. And the next action is going to be add another building block node or a product node. Um, you will choose one, and in this case, we are choosing another building block node. Um, and we have to choose at, at the next step its content. And now, based on the uh, current state, you have a probability distribution over potential elements to include. And the one that you included before, you don't include it because you already have a node in your synthesis graph with the first element. No, this, this. This element here that we included, we are not going to include it twice, and that's why you cross this one. So you will have like a masking, removing the probability of of, of this element to be zero. So this, you say the probability of this is zero, you sample from the probability of, of the next elements, and you choose this one, you fill in the content, update the representation of the current graph. All this is, is, is obtained with graph neural networks. And then you choose the next action. You fill in an empty uh, product node. And then you have to connect it to previous nodes. The previous nodes are the first, uh, uh, the first product that you included, which is this one. No, this one is the, the one that you included here. Uh, or the second one, which is the one that you included here. Uh, and you choose to connect it to this one. So this is now a, a building blo uh, an intermediate product node here that you choose to connect to the first one. And then you would be repeating these steps. So you are just uh, constructing your synthesis graph sequentially, uh, embedding the current state of the graph with a graph neural network, and then uh, using neural networks to choose the next actions. Any questions on this part? Uh, one there. How do you get the previous action embedding? The previous action embedding is uh, the current state of the of the graph. Uh, so you will have like a graph neural networks uh, generating a representation of the nodes. So <laughs> you have a a graph of graphs here. So you will have graph neural networks generating uh, representations for the content of each node, and then you will have another graph neural network generating kind of the current state of the of the of, of the whole uh, process. Um, yeah, and that's what is fed as an input to the to the neural network. Okay, uh, I get that. And uh, are you always alternating between the two? Uh is it always like an addition of a building block and a? Uh, no, you choose. I mean, it's what the model chooses, no? So you can choose here. You can choose one or the other. It's whatever you choose, no? You choose like option B or option uh, P. Or you could choose to terminate. Here, for example, there's going to be an option which is just uh, to terminate. Um, So I can have multi multi reactant reactions as well, more than two. Um, you mean intermediate uh, product nodes here? Yes, I mean. Yeah, uh, you could add uh, as many as you want. 
Okay. So the model is going to just, uh, for example, uh, you didn't have to stop here. Here we just chose to stop the whole process, uh, but you could uh, choose to add an another building block node in blue, and then another intermediate product. Uh, yeah, the model will decide when to stop or not. Um, I think it's related to that question. I was wondering, how do you choose which network to use next? Which network to use? Yeah, at each step of RNN, I noticed that you use different networks. Um, you mean by these ones? Yeah. I mean, it's just like another a head that is outputting some probabilities. So, uh, based on the hidden state of your recurrent neural network, then you have like a head that is. Uh, um, uh, you mean like uh, which to use? So, if you have uh, generated an empty building block node, you need to have this network that will output probabilities. Uh, for the, you have your library of existing molecules. Uh, so if you have created an empty building block node, you need to fill in the content. And then at this step, you need to use this network that will give you probabilities for the different uh, elements in your library. And once you have filled in the content, then the next step will be to determine if you add another building block node or a product node. And if you choose a product node, uh, then you need to determine how you connect that product node, if you connect it to previous nodes or so. So it's, it's based on the previous actions that you took. You determine which, which is the next uh, kind of head in your network that you choose. Got it, thanks. One question there, I think. So how do you deal with doubles? I mean that sometimes you need double uh, building blocks, sometimes you have byproduct, and sometimes a reaction can give you two different possibilities of molecules. Ca can you repeat the question? So I want to know how do you uh, act when you need double stuff? So it could be your building, you say that when you use one of the building block, you just put it at zero in probability. Ah, when you need like two, like for example, that yeah. you need like, I mean, um, so one possibility could be uh, to connect, one possibility could, could be to connect the, this one here, for example. So you can connect two times or three times one of the yeah. building blocks. Yeah. So the other thing is that if you have byproducts, what's happened, like if, you have two reactants to react and then give you two different molecules at the same time. Yeah, we, we consider only one. <laughs> only one. Uh, also, you don't consider that if two molecules react, they can give you two different, like one time they can give you one product and I don't know, another Yeah, time. we don't consider those things, no. Okay, thank you. And for supervision, for when, when training, uh, are you uh, having feedback uh, on each step or just at the... Yeah, I mean, you have data. Your data is going to be graphs like this, uh, like this one here on the left. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's going to be like that and you will have just supervision. You know, uh, I mean, you will have to specify an order in which you generate the, the graph. Uh, and obviously, we have here the same limitations and as the the smiles that we mentioned before, that you, you have a specific order. To address that, we generate uh, different orders for each of these graphs. Um, and then you have just this graph, you choose an order in which you could generate it, and then you just uh, evaluate the probability that the model generates uh, that graph in that order, and then you just uh, try to maximize that probability. Yes. And how, how do you choose a particular atom to which you want to connect? How do you choose how a particular particular atom to connect with? Uh, atom. Yeah. Uh, we don't connect atoms here. It's but just uh, all uh, reactants. Okay. So they they are not connected in a structural sense. They are connected in the. I mean, whatever it happens with the atoms is in this uh, <laughs> in these nodes in the green ones. Let me see. So in these nodes is when you have like changes, but this is actually done not by our method, it's done by this uh, reaction prediction method. Okay, so the fact that every single building block is chemi chemically valid is actually guaranteed by data, right? 
uh, yes, you have like a library of existing molecules, mm -hmm. and you just use that, that library. This is a limitation of this model because you are re restricted to the library that you say this is what I have already available to start with. Um, so it will be generating only molecules that you can uh, do with that library. Any other things? Good. Um, so we consider two things. You can uh, just use this autoregressive model to train it on data, and then you can generate uh, new molecules. And uh, for a particular property, for example, you see here the uh, this would be like the property, the distribution or the histogram of uh, property values in uh, the data. And then you can generate new molecules from your model. And you see that the distributions, they match quite well. So you have some empirical distribution of the, the target property on the data. You generate synthetic molecules with the model. And the two uh, distributions, the one for the data and the distribution of properties for the synthetic molecules generated by the model, they match quite well. Then you could take the molecules that have higher values of this property and then retrain the model. Let me see. You could take, for example, some data that has high values of this uh, property and then retrain the model for a few steps there and then generate new molecules and uh, repeat the process, retraining, on top molecules. And then you are able to, to obtain a model that now is generating molecules that uh, have higher values of that target property. It's an iterative process. This is actually uh, how people have used uh, generative models to do molecule optimization in a very easy way. You just train your model on data. Uh, you sample from your model. You evaluate the properties of the molecules. You take only those that have highest values of the, mole of the property, and then retrain the model and repeat, and you're able to obtain better molecules. Um, you could also use uh, an autoencoder approach. And in this case, you are conditioning on these latent variables. And that autoencoder model is going to map the synthesis graphs into a latent space. And you're going to have, this is done with an encoder. And then you have your model that generates now uh, from the low dimensional representation of the synthesis graphs, it generates the, 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 the full synthesis graph. And you could do things like uh, interpolation in latent space between synthesis graph graphs, and you will find synthesis graphs that, that are similar. Um, this is an example of this latent space interpolation. You could have a, a synthesis graph like this one, and you can map it into latent space. And then you could do a small change in latent space of your variables, and then you could decode. And you will get now another synthesis graph that is similar uh, but uh, different in some ways. No? So here, for example, this intermediate product is shared with the first synthesis graph. But now here we have a, a building block node, which is new. And then we have a final product that is new. Uh, and this molecule here, one second, uh, this molecule here is actually similar to this one. Um, they have like similar synthesis graphs, but they have also some small differences. Uh, one question. I was wondering how do you deal with um, like decoding from the latent space being meaningful when you move away from the data regions? Because this is one of the things we have a lot of problems with, especially when the latent space isn't fully covered by the data. Yeah, that's a very important problem. And I have worked on, on that problem with uh, in, in different works. Here, we're just doing a small changes from uh, data points. No? So this the first uh, node was from a data point. And then we just encode to that data point and then move uh, as, as, as slightly in latent space, and then you decode. If you move far away in latent space, then you will move into regions where the model didn't see any data. And then when you decode, uh, you will most likely decode garbage. Uh, this model works by a chemical reaction, so the probability that you get garbage is uh, small that <laughs> than if you use another uh, model that doesn't work with chemical reactions, but the model will be unreliable in those settings. Uh, that's a very difficult problem, and in general, there is no clear solution. Uh, some work that I have done with some students is to look at the decoding uncertainty. You could follow a Bayesian approach, 
and you could uh, try to uh, quantify uncertainty in the estimation of your decoder model. Uh, and in some points in latent space, uh, you could have higher decoding uncertainty. And maybe in those settings, then your decoding might not be reliable. Um, that could be one way to do it. Uh, I don't think it's, it's like a full solution. And in general, it's, uh, it's quite challenging. One of the limitations with these models is that they are brittle. And as soon as you push them away of their comfort zone, uh, then they are going to break down. So you have to be careful with, with that. Uh, regularization in the latent space, what do you mean by that? Uh, uh, no, we didn't do that here. We used, uh, so these autoencoders, they are based on, they are not, not normal variation autoencoders. They use, uh, they don't use the scale divergence um, as a regularizer. We use uh, um, a different, uh, we use a different method. I don't remember exactly the name of this, but it's, um, what was this called? Um, I think it's a different distance between distributions. Typically, you have like a, a distance between your encoding distribution, and uh, we look at a distance between your average encoding distribution and the prior, and we just uh, try to match that. Uh, that usually addresses some of the limitations of variation autoencoders. Variation autoencoders are well known for underfitting. Um, and uh, if, you, if you use uh, other regularizers, instead of the scale divergence, you, you solve those problems. More questions uh, above? Could you please elaborate more on how you train that network? What it does the loss function look like? I mean, the loss function is the likelihood. You just train it by, it, it depends on what model it is. So if it is just the autoregressive model, you just do maximum likelihood learning. And you will be sampling your data. You take like a batch of data points from your training data is this data with uh, synthesis graphs. And then you will choose an order in which you generate those graphs. And then you evaluate the probability that the model generates those graphs according to that order and, and try to maximize that. Uh, with the variation autoencoder model, there is more stuff because you will have like an encoder network um, and you have to average over uh, values of the latent variables. But it's, it's similar to how you would be training variation autoencoders. Thanks. One more question. Uh, why do you don't use uh, decoder from your Y in uh, your like another network where you predict uh, from the library uh, like result? Can you repeat the question? Yeah. So uh, and the step you have ahead where you I think you have like lookup table or whatever like uh, to get uh, like result uh, of a reac reaction. Yeah. Like why don't you use your decoder? Uh, from the graph, uh, like you have some bias that encodes your nodes, right? So why you don't use decoder and uh, like get uh, a result from the decoder, from the decoder? Uh, I don't think I fully understand the question. I think the the question is on this. Uh, yeah, yeah. On this, this part. On you this have part. A head and you are looking uh, for um, you are looking for for result in uh, some library. Yeah. But why you don't use uh, a result from the hidden state uh, and put it into a decoder and generate a result? Uh, as a molecule? Okay, so I think the question is, you have this library of candidate molecules, and uh, you could also generate the, the, the molecule. So thi this, uh, this is a library of, of uh, existing molecules, and you use them to fill in the, the building block nodes. I think your question is, why don't you generate these molecules yourself? instead of, yeah, with a decoder, you could generate them with a decoder. Uh, but if you generate them yourself, then you don't know if they will be available or not. No, that's why we have just a fixed library of existing molecules. And if you have a model that generates this intermediate, I mean, you could do it. You could try to, to, to construct molecules like that. But then your building block nodes are not guaranteed to be directly available. Uh, and that would be something to consider. Um, I mean, you could do it. but but you would have like that problem that maybe one of your building block nodes, you don't know how to do, to do it. So does that mean the products are all also part of the library? The products, no, the products, no. So this, uh, these nodes in uh, green, yeah. 
yeah. they are not part of the library. Um, they are in the data set. For the data set, for each of our synthesis graph, we have the content of these nodes. And actually, when we train our model, we don't have to worry about them because they are already there. But when we sample from our model, we, ha we have to fill in the content of those nodes. And for that, we just use existing methods for reaction prediction. We use this molecular transformer that works uh, quite well. I see. OK, so all the products are from the reaction prediction, and all the building blocks are from a data That's set. right. Okay. That's right. Good. Um, Maybe let's uh, have a look at how this works in practice. Yeah, you can do this a small uh, interpolation in latent space from, I mean, it's not really interpolation here. We just do a small steps in latent space. Uh, we tested this to do molecule optimization using this process that I mentioned before. You train your model on data, you sample from your model, uh, get the top performing uh, molecules from the data that it generated, retrain the model on those and repeat. And we compare with several baselines, and I mean our ma our model is shown here in uh, dark, in dark blue, in dark dark green. Like for example, on these are all different problems, um, and we see that it more or less uh, does similarly to other methods. Sometimes it's, uh, I mean, it's not like it's super better compared to the other methods, because the other methods also they are not restricted to work with chemical reactions. Um, our model is, is working with these chemical reactions and it's limited by the, the, the molecules that you can reach from those, but it does relatively well in terms of molecule optimization. But what is, what is interesting is that you can take the best performing molecules that were generated by this model, and then you could try to see if they are synthesizable. You could uh, do a search um, trying to find a way to synthesize those uh, molecules independently. We did this with a, a retrosynthesis tool. And what we find is that our method uh, generates a larger fraction of molecules that can be synthesized according to this retrosynthesis tool. Uh, about like uh, more than 80% of our molecules can be uh, shown to be synthesizable, while with the other methods you don't get uh, as a higher uh, fraction. And then uh, you can also look at something uh, related to the quality of the generated molecules. This is based on the Wacamole benchmark. It's a benchmark for molecule uh, generation and optimization. And they have some filters that uh, remove molecules that are not uh, considered to be uh, stable. Uh, and what we find is that our model, uh, we have a larger fraction of the generated molecules. Uh, they pass these stability filters uh, of Wacamole. And it's because they are ba built using these chemical reactions, and then they are more likely to to pass these filters because of that. Yes? Um, is it then necessary to use your model if you can just filter um, the other models that are a bit more flexible afterwards? Or does actually, like, the, w the reason that they need to be filtered maybe lead to worse training or something because they might go too much into regions. I don't know like how big a problem is if you need to do filtering afterwards. I mean, you could think of using the other models and do the filtering, but it's like a, an extra step. Uh, and then you could do your filtering, but um, you will have to specify your filtering. And uh, that, I mean, it, it might not be like a straightforward how to do that. Uh, this is only like a particular filter. So who knows what is the best filters to consider? Uh, I'm not saying that uh, this model will be uh, preferred to the others. I can imagine that there are settings where other approaches will be better. Uh, I think this model has like some advantages in, in terms of this, but obviously, yeah, it depends on maybe your problem. You may consider also using other models because maybe they are good enough. Uh, um, just one. Yeah, yes. Uh, so you one question back. Uh, you so you compared autoregressive model and uh, variational inference for uh, for for the task. Which one was better? Worked better? Yeah. So uh, so we considered autoregressive models and variational autoencoders. The variational autoencoders, the advantage is that they give you a latent representation of the data, uh, but they are usually underfitting. Um, and what we found is that for this molecule optimization process, uh, the autoregressive model is better. I think it's because it, it doesn't underfit as much as, as the other model. 
Good. Maybe just to conclude this part, uh, we have uh, described this, uh, this model that generates molecules via chemical reactions. It generates synthesizable molecules up front uh, by using these uh, chemical reactions. It is it's competitive in terms of molecule generation and optimization, and we show that the generated molecules are more stable and they have higher degree of uh, synthesizability. Cool. Uh, I want to move now to the next part, uh, which is about uh, uh, approximating the Boltzmann distribution uh, of uh, molecules with deep generative models. And the idea is here that, as I said, uh, molecules are not uh, fixed, they are not rigid objects and you have that the, the atoms they can move um, and you have an example animation here from this uh, company d -Shore research that they do uh, molecular dynamic simulations uh, so typically you will have like an er energy function and based on that energy uh, you will have a probability distribution for the atoms to be in different locations and you can see that uh, there is this uh, drug-like molecule there that is uh, binding to different parts of this target. Uh, so this was run uh, by, this animation was done by running uh, very expensive simulations. And the idea is instead of doing those expensive simulations, maybe you can actually use a deep generative model that generates independent samples right away. These simulations are based on Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, techniques. Um, so that's the idea here. Uh, you're going to have a probability distribution for the 3D location of atoms of molecules, and it's going to be related to the energy. Uh, this is called the Boltzmann distribution, and uh, it's going to be minus the energy divided by some constant and the temperature. And uh, capturing this distribution correctly is quite important because it tells you a lot about the properties of molecules. For example, if, is, if a drug-like molecule is going to bind to a target protein. Um, the current approach is to run these expensive molecular dynamic simulations. They are based on Markov chain Monte Carlo. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with Markov chain Monte Carlo. The problem is that uh, you often reject, and it's a model that is sequential. Um, so you just have to run your chain for a very long time. Um, the simulations with molecules, they use very small time steps, and this means that um, it's like simulating in time how the molecule atoms will move. Uh, and uh, to avoid rejecting a lot, you need to make very small steps. Uh, and this means that your simulation could take very long to, to run. And you can only simulate uh, very small time steps, uh, which might not be meaningful for, for physical processes. So the idea here is to use uh, deep generative models instead. You can actually have this target distribution uh, the Boltzmann distribution, and you can fit a deep generative model to approximate that, uh, minimizing some loss. Uh, this was actually proposed by Frank Noé, and he proposed uh, to use normalizing flows for this, uh, calling, calling these normalizing flows Boltzmann generators because they approximate the Boltzmann distribution for molecules. Uh, the key thing is that now you are learning your model not from samples, but you are learning your model from the energy values. So you have the, the log probability uh, of the target distribution, and you need to fit your model from that. Uh, this is not a straightforward, how to train deep generative models in this way. Uh, and it actually turns out to have like some limitations. Uh, existing methods, they have some limitations. Uh, typically, uh, you will maybe fit only a subset of the modes uh, and this is usually not good because then you are only capturing some of the things that could happen in, in practice and you forget about others. Uh, the approach that people have followed is to still combine deep generative models, training from energy with uh, training from samples, but you need samples, um, which is not ideal. Another example or an, an, an illustration of this is uh, how they fail to fit multimodal distributions. Uh, most of these Boltzmann distributions will be highly multimodal. And if you try to fit a normalizing flow to those distributions, you could do it by minimizing the Kale divergence, which is given by this expression. It, it's a distance between distributions. It's uh, zero if the two distributions are the same, positive otherwise. You could try to minimize this to make your normalizing flow fit the Boltzmann distribution. 
Uh, the problem is that if you do that, uh, your flow is going to capture only a few of the modes, as shown here. And it's going to ignore many other modes. For example, here you have many modes that are missed. And the reason for this is that this callback library divergence uh, is uh, typically low if you cover only a few of the modes and you ignore the rest. And the reason for this is that the error between your approximation Q, this is the approximation Q and this is the target P, and this density ratio represents the error. Uh, if it's one, the error is zero. And if it's different from one, you will have some error. And the error is weighted. I mean, you have the log error there. But the error is weighted by your approximation Q. This means that if you have high error in regions where Q is low, you don't care about that error. And you see it here. In this case, sorry. In this case here, in this region, the value of Q is very low because you don't generate samples in that region. Um, and the error is high because the target, you see that it has high density in those regions, but Q has low. So the error is high, but because Q has very low density there, you don't care about that error. Uh, and that's why the, the KL divergence value is going to be low, even though you are not really covering all these modes. So this method has like a, quite some problem. Uh, you can actually easily optimize this by Monte Carlo. This is an expectation of this log density ratio, and you can estimate it by Monte Carlo drawing samples from Q, and you can do a, a stochastic optimization. So optimizing this is easy, but it misses modes. Uh, what we proposed uh, in my group is to uh, optimize the flow using a different approach. In particular, not using this callback library divergence, but using some divergence called the alpha divergence. And the alpha divergence has this interesting property that it has this parameter alpha. And as you change the value of alpha, you can go from solutions that focus on covering only modes as the callback library divergence or solutions that cover more globally the target. And this is illustrated here with a mixture of Gaussians, P. P is now a mixture of two Gaussians. I mean, it has two modes. And we are trying to approximate the distribution with a unimodal uh, approximation, Q. For values of alpha that are low, um, up to minus infinity, you fit only one of the modes. And as you increase the value of alpha, you try to cover all the modes with your approximation. So you go from mode-seeking solutions to mass-covering solutions when you change this value of alpha. We are going to focus on a value of alpha 2, which is going to be mass covering. So it's going to focus on covering all these different modes. And we'll try to optimize this alpha divergence, which is given by this quantity here. Um, um, there is also another, another reason why you may want to minimize this alpha divergence. Um, and another reason why you may want to use these normalizing flows. Um, so obviously, I, I mentioned that you have these uh, dynamic simulations that are expensive to run, uh, but they are asymptotically unbiased. You could train your normalizing flow, and it's going to be biased. Uh, but one way to remove bias in your samples from your normalizing flow is doing important sampling. And the idea is that you can reweight each sample with important sampling weights. This is the density ratio between your flow and the target. Um, and if you reweight your samples in this way, you get unbiased samples, which is great. Now you have a model that generates independent samples, and you have a way to remove bias in your samples. The problem is that these uh, important sampling weights usually have high variance. And this means that uh, in practice, uh, maybe only one of your samples is useful and you have to throw away all the others. You will have one sample with massive weight and then many others with very low weight. And that usually is not, is not good. The advantage of this alpha divergence with alpha equal to two is that you can show that it minimizes the variance of the important sampling weights. You can show that it's exactly the same as the square root of your important sampling weights and that, that guarantees to minimize this variance. This means that you're going to train a flow that approximates the target, 
and uh, it's going to be mass covering, so you don't miss modes, and um, you also have low variance in your important sampling weights, which is great if you want to uh, remove bias in your samples. Uh, sorry, I have two questions yeah. to this. The first one is, uh, why do you consider cal divergence instead of negative log likelihood? Uh, uh, because it's possible in the normalizing yeah. flows. Actually. The key thing here is that you don't have data. Okay. That's why you cannot use the. Uh, if you had data, you would do maximum likelihood. Okay. <laughs> Obviously, that would be the best thing to do. Uh, yeah. You don't have the data. That's yeah, the okay. problem. Fair, fair enough. Uh, uh, another uh, question will be: uh, Do you think, if you have any ideas, if this kind of approaches could also work in discrete spaces instead um, of continuous one? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you are going to run into a lot of problems in discrete spaces. Mm -hmm. um, the main thing is that you won't have, um, I mean, no, you, you have normalizing flows for discrete spaces, but uh, they are not as good they as- They are as not as working. Yeah, they I mean, they- Actually, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, so you will run into those problems. Uh, even if you had like normalizing flows in, I mean, assuming that you had like very good uh, models, um, yeah, I guess you could you could probably apply the same methods in discrete spaces if if you had like a, a tractable model for discrete mm -hmm. for discrete data. I mean, it could be an autoregressive model. Yep. Um, that you could use something like that. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Good. So the key thing is uh, one more question. Yes. Two more. I was wondering if here it would be possible to use um, like multimodal. Um, distribution for covering like in you can do in auto encoded latent space or is it not applicable to this method if we use a multimodal no if you could use it like a vampire or something instead of having a wider distribution having like a distribution with multiple peaks so multiple gaussians oh, a mixture um, so in the normalizing flow yeah so one of the things is that the normalizing flow will take like a uh, we had something here at the beginning i think on the normalizing flow uh so you will have typically a, a base distribution that is a Gaussian. And obviously, you could have like a multimodal one. Uh, actually, I have some work with one of my students, uh, Vincent Stimper. And uh, we basically replace this, this uh, base distribution. Instead of having a Gaussian, we learn the base distribution. And uh, the main problem with the normalizing flows is that uh, they, are, they are based on this continuous uh, um, invertible transformations, and those transformations, they will try to keep uh, the connectivity of, of your original distribution. So if your original distribution is Gaussian, it has one mode, you will have to uh, split the, the transform the, the probability mass of that distribution in a smooth way, and this means that uh, uh, you will end up with some filaments. Uh, I don't know if you have seen these plots by normalizing flows, where you have multiple modes in your target, and then you try to approximate that, but because your original distribution is uh, unimodal, you will end up with very thin filaments that connect all your modes. Um, you can get rid of that by having more complicated flows, but then you need to train bigger models. And one alternative is to use a base distribution that has multiple modes. And uh, one possibility is to use a, um, I mean, what we do is we learn a, a distribution that has a rejection probability. So you sample from a Gaussian and then you reject, and your rejection probability depends on different regions of space. So you can actually take your original Gaussian and change it into uh, basically any multimodal distribution by, by using this rejection. Uh, you could do that, and it's going to help a bit, but uh, you won't r uh, get rid of this problem of uh, missing modes uh, because of the the objective that you minimize. If you minimize the Kullback library divergence, you will still run into problems. And actually, I mean, my student tried to fit these this flows with resampled base distributions, minimizing the Kullback library divergence, and it doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, good, I uh, have one, one more, more question. question. Yeah, um, I wanted to ask, do you, in this case, you still rely on, uh, or do I understand it correctly, that you still, because you initialize Q in some way, in order to actually fit that Q in a mode covering where you still kind of rely on Q being wide enough at initialization to discover those other modes? No, it, no, 
No, no, it doesn't have to be like that. We're going to see why in the next slide. Okay. Uh, you. So you could have an initialization that is quite concentrated, and this method will will find the the modes. And we're going to see next why why it finds those modes. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, could you please explain the idea of important sampling? Important sampling. Yes. Uh, it's very simple. So, important sampling. You want to sample from p of x, but you cannot do it. You can instead sample from q. So imagine that you have a data set uh, x1 uh, to xn, sample from q, and you want to approximate maybe the expectation with respect to p of some function f of x. No? You can, um, this is the integral of f of x p of x, and then you can um, write this integral um, by multiplying by q and dividing by q. And you can write it now as an integral uh, with respect to q. So now, this is now the expectation with respect to q of x of f of x, and then you have p of x divided by q of x. Um, and this is what you call the importance weight. You are reweighting each sample with a weight. So this is the expectation with respect to q um, of f of x with some weight uh, w. Uh, so this means that you can now, instead of sampling from P, which is difficult, you can sample from your approximation Q, and you can show that you will get the, the same solution. The only thing is that you need to reweight your samples um, with, the, with these weights. Uh, uh, and the problem is that um, variance can increase a lot. Typically, you, you will use a Monte Carlo approximation this is going to be an approximation over n samples from q, uh, f, x, i, and then you have your importance weight of x, i. Um, and this, this Monte Carlo approximation can have very high variance uh, if, if your approximation q is not good enough. Okay. Uh, and that's why you may want to minimize the variance of your importance sampling weights. Uh, and you can show that if you minimize this alpha divergence with alpha equal to two, you have like this this property. So you can learn now normalizing flows that will have the smallest possible variance when you do important sampling, which is is quite good. Now, uh, one thing: the alpha divergence is given by this expression here. Um, you can you can write it as this the expectation with respect to p of this uh, important sampling weight. Um, and typically, estimating this alpha divergence can be quite difficult, because you will have also high variance. Um, I mean, you could sample from uh, q. You could sample from q. And it's now the squared of the important sampling weights. No, you are sampling from q here, and now it's the squared of the important sampling weights. And we say that the important sampling weights can have high variance. So if your Q is very poor at the beginning, this thing can have like very high variance and your gradients won't be very reliable. So typically, if you try to learn your method like this, it's not going to work. Um, what we do is as follows. We are not going to sample from Q. We are going to sample from Q, but then switch those samples to be sampled from the minimum important sampling, uh, sorry, the, the important sampling distribution with the, the lowest amount of variance. Um, and maybe this is, uh, this is also something quite, quite interesting. In important sampling, I mentioned that you have, uh, I mean, you can do this approximation, no? Uh, and obtain this, uh, sorry, the writing is not, is not ideal, but you can do this approximation uh, by Monte Carlo using important sampling. And then you are using this distribution Q to estimate the expectation of uh, f of x with respect to p of x. And you could, ask, you could try to answer this question. 
what is the best important sampling distribution? What is the important sampling distribution Q that is going to minimize variance uh, of your Monte Carlo estimator? You may think, oh, maybe the important sampling distribution, the best one will be P, no, the true distribution. You could think that's reasonable, but it's wrong. And actually, there is a better important sampling distribution uh, than, uh, than, uh, than P. So the best uh, important sampling distribution is going to be actually F of X times P of uh, X. So it's actually P times F of X. Uh, assuming F is positive, maybe I'm, I'm going to write this like this with the absolute value if it's not. You can show that uh, that uh, distribution, it would be like the target P, but times uh, F of X has the lowest possible variance. And if you have a Q distribution with this, which is equal to this, if this is a um, it's going to be proportional to Q. If your Q is proportional to this, you can estimate your uh, your the value that you want to calculate, this expectation of F of X with respect to P of X, with only one important sampling, with one, in one important sample. With just one important sample, you will get the, the right quantity. If your Q distribution is proportional to to this value, which is amazing. I find that uh, super surprising. You say, oh, important sampling, it's so bad because it has high variance. But if you have the optimal important sampling distribution, you only need one sample to estimate your objective um, with, uh, with no variance. You actually reduce the variance to zero. Uh, it's extremely easy to show this. It's uh, as easy as follows. If Q, imagine that Q Q of x is some normalization constant set times f of x times p of x. And I just have one uh, sample. Um, let's assume you have just uh, one sample. Uh, my important sampling uh, distribution estimator is going to be uh, f of xi. Uh, and then I'm going to have um, p of xi, then divided by q, which is going to be z minus 1 f xi p xi. And then this goes away, this goes away, this goes away, this goes away. And this is equal to z. And z is just uh, precisely the, qu the quantity that I want to estimate. It's just the integral of f of x uh, p of x. So just with one sample, with important sampling, you get the, the right quantity. Uh, so what you can do is uh, optimize this alpha divergence by estimating it with important sampling, but using samples from a queue, uh, this queue here, this queue here is going to be uh, trying to be, I mean, you're going to try to uh, to sample from the optimal important sampling distribution. Um, so how do you do this? <laughs> uh, you, you, you can do it as follows. You can start with your flow. You sample from your flow, and then you do something called an yield important sampling, which is going to sample from a base distribution and generate samples from a target. And your target is going to be the optimal important sampling distribution for the alpha divergence. So you sample from your flow. You run a need important sampling that generates approximate samples from a target. And these approximate samples from the target are the samples from the optimal important sampling distribution. Uh, and then you just uh, estimate, estimate this alpha divergence using important sampling. Uh, but with an really important sampling that is a kind of an improved version of, of uh, important sampling, but targeting the minimum important sampling distribution. And we can see how this uh, helps to uh, find modes. 
just in this plot, uh, we were saying, how does your model find modes when it's uh, initialized maybe to sample from very narrow distributions? The reason for that is uh, this is the alpha divergence, and the optimal the optimal important sampling distribution you can show that is this um, is just um, p squared divided by q, um, and this tells you why our me our method is going to be able to sample from modes because now you have uh, p squared and then dividing by q. So if you have a missing mode, what is going to happen is that p squared is going to be high and q is going to be low. And typically q will go to zero, so this thing is going to increase massively when you have like missing, missing modes. Uh, and you can show it here. The target is p. Is this uh, orange um, distribution? And you have q, which is your approximation here. And now the optimal important sampling distribution is going to be uh, this thing in green. So you are now generating samples from those regions that you underestimate the density of the target. And those regions are precisely here on the left. Um, sorry. In this part in the left, this is where you underestimate density. No, because your approximation Q in blue is low in these regions and, and P is high. So because you are generating samples from this uh, um, optimal important sampling distribution, you will try to cover modes. Because precisely this missing modes is what's what hurts you in important sampling. If you have a missing mode, Q has very low density values there because you are missing the mode, and P has high values, so your important sampling weight for any sample in that missing mode is going to be huge. Uh, so that's what, what you want to avoid. And when you try to, to generate samples in this way, you are, you are exploring to, to get rid of those uh, missing modes. Uh, so this is the method, basically. You sample from your flow, you use an idle important sampling to transform samples from your flow into samples from the minimum variance important sampling distribution. You evaluate the alpha divergence in that way um, with, with those samples, and then you optimize your Q distribution to minimize that uh, alpha divergence. Um, and there is something else there. We use a replay buffer so that you don't throw away samples because you, you sample from your flow, you improve those samples with an idle important sampling, um, and then that's expensive. And then if you throw away those samples, then you are throwing away useful information. And you could just have them in a memory and you just resample uh, the data from, from that. Uh, just to, to conclude, I, I want to show how this works in practice. This is a, a initial flow. This is how we initialize our flows. They are missing all the modes, <laughs> no? Because they are like uh, quite narrow. Uh, this is what you obtain when you train by maximum likelihood when you have data from the target. And obviously, you cover all the modes because you have data from all these modes. If you minimize the callback library divergence, then you get something like this, where you miss the modes. Uh, you have many other baselines that uh, uh, I won't go much into the details, but this is basically our method with a replay buffer. This is without the replay buffer, but with a replay buffer, which is what works better, is this one. And it covers all the modes. And you are not using real samples from the target. You are just uh, generating samples from the minimum variance important sampling distribution. You are able to cover these modes. Um, we apply this to model the Boltzmann distribution for this al alanine dipeptide, which is like a be benchmark commonly used in, in, this, uh, in this area. And the idea is that uh, the molecule is shown here. It has these different atoms. And most of the, the bonds, they are kind of rigid, except uh, these two. Uh, so there is this part of the molecule with these angles. These are some rotation angles uh, 
for this uh, central part of the molecule. Um, and this is the part that is more flexible and can move. Um, and it's what uh, people care in, in general. Like you want to approximate this, the distribution of this quite well. We show here a 2D histogram for these angles. So you will be sampling from the 3D configuration of the atoms. This is about 30 dimensions. Um, but then you, you look at the histograms of the angles, uh, uh, phi and psi in this plot, uh, and you see that there are multiple modes there. This is the ground truth generating uh, some simulation for quite some long time. This is what you get if you fit a flow by maximum likelihood to samples, and then um, you sample from your flow, and you look at the histogram. And you see that you capture the modes, but uh, for example, your samples are maybe not that great in these regions. Uh, you have maybe higher probability there. You didn't have any data, um, and that's why the flow there is making some mistakes, because there, there is no real data in, in that region. Uh, we can see our method uh, with the flow that you obtain. This is the flow that gives you the minimum variance important sampling weights. And you see that it's fitting more or less well the target. You have a slightly broader uh, coverage. For example, here in this region, you see that this is quite narrow here, and our method has like wider coverage here. Uh, but the reason for this is that this is the minimum variance important sampling distribution, and you want to have a slightly wider coverage because that minimizes variance. Uh, and you can see that when you do important sampling afterwards, you get uh, almost perfect samples because you remove all the bias in, this, uh, in these samples. And it's almost indistinguishable from the ground truth. Uh, and this is quite remarkable because this is the first uh, time that anyone trained these flow models on this type peptide without using actual data. Uh, I mean, we are generating our data with a, a need important sampling targeting the minimum variance importance uh, sampling distribution. But we are the first one to, to be able to solve this problem with almost perfect approximation with the flow. Um, yeah, and that's, uh, that's it with this method. This, we call uh, this method. Uh, uh, I would yeah. have a short question regarding the important sampling. Yeah. Um, because, like, um, if you could go like one slide earlier, please. Yeah. Or like another one, like where the formula is. Um, exactly. So, if like your Q um, is quite poorly approximating your uh, P, um, and so you get like quite low values for Q, um, could that not lead to quite um, numerically unstable um, procedure? So do you use some sort of truncated important sampling? So if it's like really low, like really at zero? Yeah, so what can happen at the beginning is that uh, you get uh, numerical problems because you sample from Q, and maybe your Q value gives very low values. Uh, your samples from Q have very low density values, and, and P has high values. And you could get like uh, none values or infinites. We are throwing away those. Uh, at the beginning of the optimization, you may get these, these things, and we just throw away those samples and just uh, optimize the objective um, with, the, with the data that is left. Uh, in practice, so one thing, it can happen that you have infinite variance. When you do important sampling, that's one of the, the problems with important sampling, and you have to be quite careful. Uh, your estimator can have infinite variance. Uh, and the thing that we would be optimizing, this alpha divergence with alpha equal to 2, uh, for the initial value of the flow, it could have infinite variance. Uh, but we are estimating a Monte Carlo uh, approximation, and the Monte Carlo approximation will always be finite, and we are trying to minimize that. So even if the original objective is not well defined because it would be infinite, because we are using this Monte Carlo approximation, we are always minimizing something that is uh, finite, trying to make it uh, smaller. Right, but like when you really get this and then will you just swallow them away? So, or you could also just like do some small epsilon in the denominator, right? So you can also do that. I think in this, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not fully sure about the details because it was my student who was doing this experience, but uh, he told me he was throwing away Whenever he was getting nuns, uh, he was uh, throwing them away. And then you will have like a, you will evaluate your important sampling estimate of the objective um, only with a subset of the original samples. Any other question? One more. 
I wanted to ask, because it's not immediately clear to me, how important is the the alpha divergence as compared to KLQP um, in this case? Like, wouldn't we get qualitatively dissimilar? I mean, um, you can see it here in this in this oh. in this uh, plot. Like, KLQP is this, is this uh, solution. Oh, sorry. Okay. Thank you. One more question. Just to follow up on Adam's question, uh, so is scale divergence, it is quite widely used, so uh, how common are the classes of problems in which such results happen that um, the alpha divergence is better or seems to be better? I mean, I think this is uh, not super clear. I think it depends on the problem. I could say if you have multiple modes, and you care about capturing those modes, then this alpha divergence might be better. Um, in some cases, you don't care about those modes. That happens uh, many times with maybe neural networks. Neural networks, you have multiple modes just because of permutations of your neurons uh, and symmetries that you have, and then maybe capturing only one of the modes is enough. Uh, um, maybe your target is unimodal, and then you don't have to worry about that. I uh, know oh it depends on the problem. In this case, you have these multiple modes, and you want to do important sampling. So I think that makes the case for this alpha divergence bigger, because you want to cover multiple modes, and you want to minimize variance in important sampling. One more question. So uh, when I look at the plot, you're getting a lot of samples in the uh, like the minima. But um, the, if I want to estimate the free energy difference between two minima, so I also want some points on the transition. So can uh, like have you thought of how you can do this using this? Not really. <laughs> uh, I think people are working on this. And uh, I mean, I was in a conference last week in Berlin, and uh, they had some uh, way of generating samples with some bias uh, to, to go through the mi minimum energy path between the modes. Uh, but I mean, I'm not an expert in that area. And I can imagine maybe this could be useful or maybe not. I don't, I don't really know. I have one more follow-up. Because I have, the, the, am I correct to say, th does that flow with KLD use the annealed importance sampling step of your method? Uh, no, it's just trained right. on the on the. I mean, you don't need it because you can estimate the objective. No, I, uh, I understand, but so m my point is, sorry, my I want to rephrase my, rephrase my original question. Basically, I was wondering in your method, including the AIS, because that's really what allows you to target different modes, right? Yeah. Like it's the AIS step really that explores the modes. Yeah. Not really the KL step. Yeah. Uh, so I wonder what is the influence of the. Yeah, the alpha divergence when you use the AAS step, like basically an ablation of using, yeah, the KL divergence versus. I mean, we tried, uh, instead of using the alpha divergence with alpha equal to two, we tried the uh, alpha divergence with alpha equal to one, which is the reverse divergence, and it's also mass covering, and it worked uh, way less. Uh, I think it's because of the variance, because, I mean, the. When you run an important sampling, you will also have important sampling weights, and I think you will have also higher variance. Uh, I mean, I, I I I can tell you that we tried this uh, reversed KL divergence, which is it would be alpha equal to one, and that works uh, worse than that. There is an appendix. I think there are some results in the appendix of the paper describing this, and at least I mean we didn't do like an exhaustive examination, but. At least that seems to indicate that this alpha divergence has better properties than if you use other other divergences. Yeah, sorry, I was just kind of asking this question because you said like the alpha divergence is a key ingredient, so I just wanted yeah, to check. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So we tested the uh, other values of alpha and and uh, alpha equal to two was better. We tried we tried larger values of alpha and the smaller values of alpha and and performance was worse. Thank you. Good. So I think that's probably all. Uh, I wanted to talk about some meta learning methods, but I didn't uh, have time. Uh, just to finish, I would like to thank my collaborators on this uh, on these works that I presented. Uh, 
yeah, thanks everyone. I think we can have a break now for lunch. Uh, yeah, I, I think that we have like five more minutes or something for a Q&A session if you guys have any more questions to our guest. No more. Okay, <laughs> so I, I have one more because that okay. whole Q&A session is for me, sorry. <laughs> Uh, actually, I have like the general question about the uh, mm, deep generative models families that you use because right now you mentioned like mostly autoencoders and uh, the normalizing flows which are mm -hmm. like density oriented. But did you try in any of those projects like different families? I do not mean like guns because they are not so good, but yeah. actually to the first one, I have an opinion that using the diffusion models will be quite quite good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. So the question is why these deep generative models, there are also other options, and why maybe this and, and not others? Uh, I think each model, it has some advantages and disadvantages, and I think it depends on the application where you may choose one model on a, or another. For example, GANs, people have tried to use GANs with, uh, to generate molecules. The main problem is that molecules are discrete objects, and GANs, they rely a lot on uh, gradients and differentiation. You have like a, a discriminator, and then you have to change uh, um, the samples generated by your generator so that they fool the discriminator. And what happens is that uh, with discrete samples, you don't, you don't have gradients, and then you are going to run into problems. There are ways to kind of go beyond that, but you require approximations, and in the end, I think they, they don't really solve the problem. Uh, so I think that's why GANs are not so widely used in the, in the area of molecules. Uh, you could also use, uh, for example, diffusion models. Diffusion models would be an alternative to these normalizing flows um, for both man for, for approximating these both man distributions. The issue with diffusion, I mean, diffusion are great. They are very flexible models. You almost don't have any constraints. No? With the uh, normalizing flows, you have to have invertible transformations. You have to have a tractable Jacobians so that your log density values are fast to to evaluate. So you have a lot of restrictions and diffusions don't have anything like that. You just have like a score function and that's and that's it. The problem with diffusion is that uh, if you want to generate samples or if you want to evaluate the density of your model, it's more expensive than with flows. These flows, for example, they are based on coupling layers and that's extremely fast uh, to generate samples. Generating samples, uh, evaluating densities, uh, it's very fast. With diffusion, it's going to be more expensive. Uh, for this annealed important sampling, you need to evaluate densities uh, and you need to generate samples. Uh, and if it's uh, slow to do that, then you're going to run into problems. That's why we didn't really consider diffusion. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, it would be great if you could do this with diffusion, but you run into this bottleneck of... Uh, right, I, yeah. I was th thinking mostly on the first project because there I suppose okay. that we could have like, for example, yeah. the conditional distribution across the whole potential molecules and then just adding in the different diffusion steps. Yeah, um, yeah, you could do that. I mean, I'm not like an expert in diffusion okay. and I mean, the, in the first project it was more on discrete data and maybe with diffusion it's going to be, I mean, you will, you, you will have to do some approximations. People have done diffusion also on discrete data and uh, they usually truncate, uh, they, they kind of work with continuous data and then they truncate it. Um, you could think of doing something like that, but I mean, you run also again into problems because you work with sequences that have different lengths and uh, maybe diffusion they are, are less suitable and these autoregressive models, they are more, more suitable there. But uh, I don't know. I mean, we did all this before diffusion actually came out, so. <laughs> okay, <laughs> cool. Uh, do we have any more questions? So I think we can warmly thank our guest for his amazing Thanks. talks.